Hello, Yeshua Network, and welcome to the entire Bible read-through. My name is Alex Lovovsky, and with me is, of course, the one and only... The, the other guy. It's the other guy. The other guy, whatever his um, name is. And we don't shamefully promote Yeshua. Mm, let me get up for a second. What? Oh, oh what's, that this, what's that on my shirt? What's that on my shirt? There's something, oh. there's something that way. There goes my oh, oh. oh, let me just adjust my, my mm. hat here. Oh, okay. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi, it's great to be with you. <laughs> Woo! And yes, we is. love our new gear. We totally, totally yeah. love our new gear. I can't get enough of this hat. Nathan can't get enough of the hat or the shirt, right, Nathan? Yeah. Well, this one, yeah, we got another one. We get to switch them out, so we get like new ones. It's pretty awesome. Correct. So yeah, guys, we're like we're like little kids, you guys. We're like little kids right now with these with these shirts and these hats. I've oh, by the way, has it worked already for you? Have you had anybody come up and talk to you? I've had multiple people well, come up and talk to me because of the hat. That's cool. I, I don't. You don't leave the. House. I don't leave the house, so I have no reason to leave the house. So yeah, I haven't had that experience yet, but I plan to. Yeah. Uh, the video is looking better. Oh hey, uh, I want to thank you guys real quick. Um, uh, there's been some wonderful, wonderful, uh, you wonderful people at Yeshua Network have been contributing to the cause, and it seems like there's going to be enough uh, enough funds for me to be able to buy a new computer that's going to make these videos much smoother especially the uh you know my my old laptop here is is struggling for these um uh zoom or skype uh versions of this video so uh i'm super excited and super humbled and i i'm i'm very grateful you guys and um as once the parts are ordered and it comes in i'll be making more videos putting the thing together and uh you guys will get to see what an amazing thing you've uh you've made happen so i'm super yeah. excited Yes. And I'm grateful to you guys. Thank you so much for your contributions and help. It is, it is amazing. So let's, uh, Alex, put your hand up on the cube. Just put your hand up so everybody can see the cube. Mr. Q Mr. Squarey. Oops. We're going to call him Mr. Squarey because we're not going to be able to see Mr. Squarey Square's hopefully here. pretty soon. There it is. Uh, I don't know. Nope. Is it a, oh, you got nope. it? Here we go. Okay. So we're going to say, we're going to say goodbye to Mr. Squarey soon, but he will be remembered and he will be a part of the of the entire Bible read yes. for many years to come. Hallelujah. That's the issue. Is like <laughs> if I if I do this, my face is in the square. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Okay. All right. So jumping on, you guys are mostly on. Hello everybody from around the world. Thank you guys for <clears> tuning in. Especially if it's, you know, late or super early for you. We do appreciate it. And uh yeah, you guys, we're in Psalms. One of the least favorite books of believers in the whole Bible. This is this is a book that most people just cannot stand. It, it agitates them. It's very dark and depressing, and uh, it's very it's very hard to get through. It's very hard to get through. So um, that is a total, complete sarcasm. Am I wrong? Yeah, that was that was pretty thick sarcasm. I mean, I, if I could have put it on any thicker, it'd be peanut butter. What, what are we doing? <laughs> we actually okay. have a ton of comments this week, and uh, we're not that surprised yes. because the book is inspiring, open to interpretation, et cetera, et cetera. So we we really have to cook to try and get through all of them. Uh, this week uh, we're looking at twelve and a half thousand words, ladies and gentlemen. Um, real quick, by the way, we don't do this very often anymore because we've gotten so used to it. But hey, if you're joining us for the first time ever, if you're finding this video right. for the first time ever, and you're like, what is going on? I don't understand what they're doing. This is way too out of context for me. That's totally normal. We're uh, let, let us encourage you to go ahead and start from the beginning. You can find all the Bible read-through videos here on Yeshua Network. You can start with the very first video where we explain what the process is going to be like. And then you can follow along and definitely read the Bible while doing it. That's the most important part of all of it. Read it for yourself. Yes, don't just watch the videos, guys. Yeah. You're not going to get 90% of it because we're just talking about the passages. Exactly. We're not reading. Them for you, so. Exactly. Yes. Occasionally, we do read passages when they're part of the comment, but that's obviously not, <laughs> that is not enough. You definitely need to be reading it by, uh, you know, by yourself before the video. Um, well, well, and it's reading it on your own, on your not own. by yourself. On your own. You can have another, you can have another person with you. Right. Yes. Thank you. So, all right. So should we, uh, should we continue? Yeah. With the, uh, 
with the songs? Uh, Can we start this, start this show? Let's do it. Uh, we got some general comments to get through. Not too much. Here we go. Uh, Terry McCracken. I'm finally caught up with the group. I'm so excited for Sunday. And Karen uh, comments, it's so awesome, isn't it? Uh, yeah. We love love to see that. Welcome, Terry. And thank you, Karen. And we agree. It is indeed awesome. Uh, Evelyn Perkins. Uh, so I started rereading the Bible again and started watching your videos. I'm in video three. My question is, can I read Psalms still and watch live on Sundays? I enjoy the fellowship. I know you say don't skip, but I have read the Bible before many, many years ago. And I think, uh, Nathan, you already answered that question. And of course, of course you can. Um, yes, we encourage you guys to watch live. Sure. We just don't want you to uh, to only watch live. Like we just don't want you to uh, watch live on Sunday and then like just be with us live and in, in where we're at in the Bible and like have not also done that. We want you to do both at the same time. So if you're just tuning in, watch live with us, participate. It's wonderful. But at, try to catch up like like was just mentioned by some folks. It is super important. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sagrina Gailas writes, I had only time to give my notes for the first 10 chapters of Psalms, another great book of the Bible. I think there's so much to say about them, so many interesting things in there, like the whole Bible in itself, of course. Well, Sabrina, um, thank you for the comments you were able to make, and I'm looking forward to reading them. Um, Ralph Johnson, general comment. When reading Psalms this week, when they would speak of evil acts, I caught myself praying and repenting for certain things. Hallelujah. The ways of my old life and how sometimes they can even sneak in nowadays. For example, slander. It can be very hard sometimes to not want to just burst out when you hear things from others that someone is saying against you while they're not present. Thank goodness, thank goodness for Yeshua. Amen. Yeah, amen, Ralph. Thank goodness for Yeshua. And thank you for your that, thank you for your testimony on that. Um, how many times do we go reading that, uh, reading something in the Bible? Go, oops, oops, I do that. Oops, I've done that. Oops, I didn't know that was a sin. <laughs> oops, I didn't realize I was doing that. <laughs> oops. Yeah. So basically, I have to think. I have to ask God for forgiveness for my pure existence. You know, and so that's just basically me. So it's just like, oh, sorry, God, I, I breathed air the wrong way again. My bad. You know what I mean? That's just like, I feel like I'm in a, a perpetual state of repentance, which is good. Actually, I don't mind it. Because the Lord has showed me the blessing of submitting and being humbled and being chastised. I'd rather, me and Alex were talking about this this week actually, I would much rather be chastised by my father for my sins than to be left alone and be left in the sin. Cool. Right, Alex? Absolutely, 100%. And uh, Jennifer, yeah, thanks. Loving the new hats and, and shirts. We, we are obviously loving them too. It's a lot of fun to wear them. Feels good. Yeah, I hope you guys reached out to Lynn. She is so she is so so uh, moved and so uh, blessed by all the positive comments that you guys left her and encouragement. I really appreciate that, guys. You are so awesome. And and the reason why we also feel so bold in wearing this, you guys, is that we're not selling them. That we ourselves aren't the ones like selling them. So it's not like we're marketing this. To, it's like you know we're not trying to make a penny off of this. So if you're somebody who's just tuning in, you're like, wow, these guys really push it. Merch. Yeah, we're pushing merch. We're pushing. We're pushing the blessing of of getting the word of God out there, but we're not selling it. So yep, we're, we're we're encouraging you guys to go to Sister Lynn or go out there and make it yourself. You know, whatever you guys want to do. But yeah, I'd much rather like I I am so so much happier wearing a hat like this than than uh, some brand. So, anyways, we're off topic. All right, I'm on uh, the same page. All right, here we go. So prior chapters, uh, Fannis Prinsloo writes, the main reasons that Job couldn't have lived in Abraham's or Jacob's or even uh, Jacob's son's time, especially Joseph, is that uh, all were righteous men. As per Job 1.8, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. This is one of the links, uh, chicagobible.org, did Job live before Abraham? Uh, we find that 70 souls left Canaan and traveled to Egypt, Genesis 46, 13. Among them, there was one man called Job, son of Issachar, and the sons of Issachar, Tola, Puva, and Job, and Shimron. Uh, we also read that J Jacob had a twin brother called Esau, who had four sons, one of them named Eliphaz. 
Within the book of Job, we find both names. Job had three comforters or friends who came to talk with him. One man was called Eliphaz. Um, thus, the relationship between Job and Eliphaz may be proven by connecting Genesis 46, 1, Chronicles 1, 1 Chronicles 1, and Job 2. However, some may say that the people in the book of Job uh, reference a different Job and a different Eliphaz. There are many other scriptures which might further connect them. Are there any, I'm sorry, are there any other scriptures which might further connect them? Yes, in Eliphaz's talk to Jacob, he said, What knowest thou that we knowest not? What understandest thou which is not in us? With us are both the gray-headed and very aged men much elder than thy father, Job 15. Eliphaz mentioned Job's father, and he indicated that he knew him. He also mentioned that one of them, and directly pointing back to himself, was older than his father. Eliphaz mentioned that he was older than Job's father, Issachar, and that was very true. We remember that Esau married when he was only 40 years old in Genesis 26, 34, and he took two wives. Jacob didn't get married until he was about 70 years old. So, of course, Esau's sons were older than Jacob's sons. This is exactly what Eliphaz said, that he, Eliphaz, was older than his father, Issachar. So, this scripture supports the assertion that the genealogy from Genesis is connected to Job. Another proof focuses on what God said about Job, Job 1.8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? So, as a result, we see that Job lived during a time when there were no other people better than him, during which period of time were there no others with Job's righteousness. Returning to the Genesis genealogy, we find that Job must have lived after all the sons of Jacob died and before Moses, in a time in mm. which there were no other faithful people. Some suggest that Job could have lived during Abraham's and Melchizedek's time. Mel Mel Melchizedek's time. Some suggest that Job could have lived during I'm sorry, I'm rereading the same sentence. Woo! Struggling already. We just got started. Some suggest that Job could have lived during Abraham's and Melchizedek's time. That would conflict with the scripture that was that there was no man on earth like him, Job, because Abraham was a man of faith. Abraham received the promise that in him and his seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Mm -hmm. hmm. Great, wonderful research there, um, Fannis. Thank you so much. Mic drop. Where's my That's mic? Awesome. I'm dropping mics for you. Yeah, you gotta drop um, I would love Goodness, to. That was amazing, bud. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. For real. I would love to um, pick up scripture and cross-reference all of your uh, all of your references here to get a, as clear a picture as you describe here. But um, I trust that you've done the yeah. work here, and that in fact, so Job. Uh, let me just. Well, it makes sense. It does. So, it makes sense. I mean, it does make sense on this. It does make sense what you're saying there, but good find. Um, See, and I believe you guys are awesome. And it it, it, it so the the conclusion is that Job would have been a grandson of Jacob. Is that right? Am I getting that right? Is that what you understood, Nathan? Um, that's I think the conclusion. He was the son of Issachar, who would have been yeah okay. Among them, there is one man called okay. Uh, Seventy souls left Canaan, traveled to Egypt. Among them, there was one man named Job, son of Issachar. Yeah, Issachar was one of that's one of the tribes. Okay, right. And the sons of Issachar, Tola, Puva, and Job, and Shimron. Yeah, and and yeah. You're, it is very true that Job must have existed before Moses because uh, Moses received all of the law and received ten commandments. Um, exactly. So yeah, uh, the sons of Issachar, Tola, yep. and Job. Okay. It's interesting. Job must have lived probably, uh, I think it's described that he lived in the south, in like the southern region of Canaan or like the very southern border, which would make sense too, because uh, that would have been kind of near Egypt where the rest of them were, but not totally there. Anyway. Right. Close enough to trade or whatever, but not necessarily part of the governance of it. Yeah. Really good work, man. Really good work, yeah. Wow. I'm going Love to. Uh, I'm definitely going to look into that more myself. That sounds fascinating. Okay, so let's go ahead and switch to our Psalms one through twenty this week. Haslams, yeah, baby. Haslams. <laughs> what? 
How did you just pronounce that? Pasalms. 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 You gotta add the. There's a P there. Right. Pasalms. Um. <laughs> Veronica Marie says hi everyone and hi twinsies. Yep, we're twinsies. We are. We're twinsies today. We are twinsies. Um. Okay. Do you think the words Do you think the words Yeshua Network are on the screen enough? Do you think the name Yeshua is on the screen enough? No. I don't no, think I it's think, on the screen I think enough. We need to put it on more. I'm just gonna sit like this. It's 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 over right, there in the corner. Done. Here we go. And then it's it's on the heads. Okay. There. It's just gonna, so I'm just sure gonna sit like that. I know it looks weird, but I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thematic. Um, Crystal Elizabeth, I started off my day with a bad attitude, thinking, why does it have to be this way? <laughs> and kind of resentful. And before I started Psalms, I prayed to God to rescue me from my attitude. Why? While, mm. while I was reading, he unraveled my thinking and brought me to see things from his perspectives. Hallelujah, Krista. He made me realize the wickedness of people and imagine having an unjust judge and how awful that would be. God is just, fair, and loving, and he plays by his own rules. He respects our free will. He can't force us to follow him. That's why the world is the way it is. I like how real David is in the Psalms and how he poured out his heart to God. It makes me feel better that I can bring my true feelings to God and have him help me. He wants relationship. I'm so blown away that this is even an option to have the Creator as my Father. And it's his choice to do this. Mind blown. Mics are falling left and right. I love that, Krista. I love it. I agree with you a thousand yeah. million percent. That is exactly a million, 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 million agreements from this from this guy right here. I cannot tell you. That is exactly man. The fact that we get to come to the Lord and just be like, um, I'm dust. I'm nothing. And not because we're just abusing ourselves for non-believers out there watching this, maybe or no. It's because we just when you when you put when you put a cubic zirconia next to a real diamond. You know, it's it's it just doesn't hold up, guys. It just doesn't hold up. And so, you know, we're his creation, so we're beautiful in his eyes. That makes us beautiful. But man, he is perfect and wonderful, and he just wants relationship. I'm sorry, I'm just so stoked about what you said. I'm I know gonna, it's just I awesome, can. Krista. You you, you yeah. so nailed it. You so nailed it. You so nailed it. Yeah. You so nailed it. And uh, that's the one thing we were talking about this week as well. We, I think both Nathan and I, the one thing I. I can I, I at least I can testify to is that the perspective shift and the mood shift that when you're feeling particularly crappy about what's going on with you or with the world in general or or you're just stuck in some in some like dramatic depressing drama, drama feeling in your mind about something you can't change and you just ask him for help on that and it just goes away like it never so. existed it's unbelievable Unbelievable. Just lay it at his feet. Lay it at his feet. Just lay it at his feet. Let him do it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Good word. Karen Musil, reading through these verses, I am so much reminded of our of deeply of how deeply our Father despises sin and the importance of striving every day to follow his will in our daily life. That's right. He loves us. He hates sin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ricardo, general comment on Psalms. On my personal experience with this book, must share with you that it took me like two or three months to finish reading, maybe even more. I know about someone who shared in the testimony group that was going to the same. It was a hard task. Not saying that it was boring, but like it was hard to read, getting lost on sentences, reading a line like several times, getting sleepy, like when reading all words mixed up and lost meaning and not understanding made me read a line again and again did any of you happen to have the same with psalms oh my gosh ricardo well hello my friend that's exactly the ex <laughs> hello, my, <laughs> hello my friend that's exactly the experience have i had me? have my you met me Alex. yeah i i don't know if you remember but when we restarted the entire bible read through uh we talked about how I started reading on my own and got stuck in psalms and that's exactly the experience i was having and this time around, why don't, why don't, why don't you, hmm? yeah, go ahead, buddy. That's what I was gonna say. Why don't you, why don't you tell them though about that? Like, tell them about reading it, and and then talk about what what you did experience when you came to Psalms. Yeah, and then and then talk about what happened this time around. Absolutely, because so, I think it's a, I think it's a really important thing. Plus, that we do have people agreeing with. Yeah, you. Evelyn says yes. So yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, when I was reading it for the first time, 
uh, I was very interested, of course, in the story, in the story parts of the Bible. So those things flowed. Uh, as we've already talked about in other in, in, in other videos and constantly that you know when it, when you got to the begots it was kind of like okay let's get through this I don't really know and then let's just get to the story and when you hit Psalms and here's the interesting part I had read Job before I had read that book before it was a very important book and I even the first time I read it I could sense there was a lot going on there even though I don't think I realized the half of it to be completely honest with you. But I read Job before, and so when I got to Job in my first read-through, I decided to skip it. And I skipped Job and went straight to Psalms, and then it's like I hit a swamp, and I was just stuck in mud, and it's the same description that Ricardo describes. I was sleepy, I had to reread sentences, I didn't, it didn't really, I was like, I don't, why do I need to hear somebody's praise? And it was, it was crazy, the level to which it was unavailable to me. Reading it now, though. Uh, as we've gone through this whole experience together, guys, and as we've really taken our time to read all of the begots, to look and understand about what's going on, and really, really chewed and and, and eaten Job as much as we have, and like I digested it. Yeah, digested it. And there's so much more probably there still, not denying that at all. Suddenly the Psalms and the characters that we just read about go through all these things and the time we took to like you know, imagine and, and, and see, really check and see what they went through. Psalms is amazing. And not only that, the very first chapter of Psalms, I'm sure people have mentioned, we certainly saw it, is like the absolute must read post Job. It's like they go together. So reading the Bible out of sequence, I recommend against it. Uh, this is another one of those pieces of uh, evidence for me um, as to why. And um, I don't know about you guys out there, uh, um, uh, but uh, Psalms to me right now is a completely different animal. In fact, I mean, we had we had an amazing experience reading it together uh, um, this week, and and I'm sure you guys all did because there's a lot of comments. <laughs> yeah. I hope I hope did I do it justice, Nathan? I know we've talked about it in private. I can't remember now what to say. What, what, you know. Yeah. You did good. I think that's because we've talked about it so many times. You're probably like, you, you just diluted it a little bit. But I think that there's, I think that for me, I loved hearing the story about how you were reading the Bible by yourself the first time and you were just really trying to get through it. But you, you chased a lot of rabbit holes. You were getting confused about a lot of things. I kept telling you, stop chasing the rabbits. Just read the Bible once straight through and focus on it first. And then you're like, okay, okay, okay. Like every week. And then you finally realized they were rabbit holes that you were kind of not wasting your time but you realized that they were not pointing towards the same object right so toward the same same thing and then you, you skipped job and then you jumped into psalms and it just when you came to me you're like i can't finish psalms I, I cannot get through it i'm trying and i can't get through it mate and i was just like man then you know you we gotta pray about that like i i can't understand because for me when you get the psalms you're just like like basically what me and you experienced this time is what I experienced before because I read it in order right and so and so I couldn't understand what you were saying about Psalms and so when when then when we read it this time and then watching what happened so I'm going to tell you guys a little something and me and Alex had made a promise not to really talk that much this video but that's going out the window already <laughs> um I'm, I'm going to be very quick I'm going to be very quick I, we got to give a testimony you guys um the Holy Ghost hit us on Psalm number four I yeah, think we were number four, halfway think. through five. Number five? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and literally, you guys, I couldn't control myself. I fell to the ground. I started speaking in tongues. Uh, the Lord moved. The Holy Spirit came and filled the room and, like, hit both me and Alex. Alex started speaking in tongues. And, you guys, this has never happened in the entire read-through. Not, 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 not to this caliber. Uh, God gave me word of knowledge for Alex and, and uh, translation of dream for him. And, and it was all just all sorts of stuff going on. And, and it was pretty amazing. And... And, uh, and, and you could, and, and, and I don't want to take, you know, Alex's moment here, but he, he also had a lot of, you could see that the ghost was hitting him and that he was kind of just, I don't know, in awe, Alex, I don't, I'm not trying to speak for you, bud, but you were just kind of, you know, well, you, you usually talk so much that this time you were just so quiet. It was just, <laughs> so I'm just kidding. So yeah, anyways, I, uh, it was a really powerful thing and it happened in Psalms. So for me, that's what Psalms ha was like. So when Alex told me he can't get through it. And, and his mind can't focus. I'm just like, I don't understand that at all. Like, I, I didn't have that experience. 
so then we had the experience um, together that for me, like, you know, the Bible is normally and, and it was so powerful that like, and that, that, that's really, I guess I wanted to kind of, you were probably holding back to get enough. I wanted you to share that. I guess. No, no. I mean, you know, there's, yeah, it, it was, it was uh, awesome. It felt normal though, too, which is really weird, really weird that it felt normal. Does that make sense? It was a supernatural kind of experience that felt totally like it belonged it exactly where it happened and there's nothing weird about yes. it. That's what's yeah. so and crazy we, about it. This, this didn't feel weird. Yeah. It, it hurt. It, 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 I don't know if you guys have ever gotten hit by the ghost where it literally like puts you onto the ground. Like you can't sit, you have to, you like have to lay on the ground. Has anybody ever had that kind of hit of the Holy Ghost? So that it, it's only happened to me. Well, in front of another person, it's only happened to me like maybe seven or eight times in my whole life. So this was like number seven or eight. It was pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, and the Lord gave a good word. And, uh, you know, I know that, that we'll be sharing more of that to come. And I think that we're going to be all seeing a lot more of that, guys. So get ready for it. Holy Ghost, if you haven't experienced it yet, trust me, it's coming. Just yeah. have the faith. It's, it's, it's going to come and hit you soon. Hallelujah. Um, and Jose, just to answer your question, I didn't skip Job the first... Or I had read Job out of sequence, so when I got to it in sequence, I skipped it and went straight to Psalms. That's that's what that's right. what I was that's saying. That's what we meant. That's what we were saying. Yeah, yeah. Because um, he read it first, then went back, then he's like, "Oh, I've already read it," so he jumped over it. Yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, which yeah. which is uh, really taught me now that the Bible is more than just information. There's a sum of the parts that happens in the exact sequence it happens that's mind-blowingly like it's, you know, as Nathan said in the first video, it's the key that unlocks the door. Um, Amen. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, about this week, we don't want to go on and on because it's kind of out of context for you guys. But um, Psalms is uh, very powerful, very interesting, very yeah. amazing. And, and, and so basically, I think that the, the, the moral of the story today with what we're saying and what we will move back on here is is that if if you've ever read the Bible and you kind of do feel overwhelmed and you don't really feel like you're getting anything, could it be simply one, maybe you don't have fellowship when you're reading it, that might be a good thing to do is find somebody to physically read it with. I know that can be hard for some of you, but have somebody in the room sharing, talking, making it alive, not just something like I'm reading, I'm studying, I'm memorized. Like, no, make it a thing that, that, that you're, you're breathing. Speak it out loud. Even the Bible says to read the scripture out loud. So, you know, it's like, and then and then read it in order. It will make a difference, you guys. So that that's kind of the, the, the one thing I want to push here. And then I'm done. Uh, Jennifer Wulever, you're, you're asking, but we have the Holy Spirit in us. How does it hit you again? Just can't quite understand. Um. Well, it's like the Holy Spirit has like a, the Holy Spirit is kind of like always with you. And sometimes you don't even know it's with you until God forbid the Lord actually like take it away from you. And then, and then you will understand the emptiness and the vast coldness of being without it. But when you, when you get hit with it, it's like you're going from one to a hundred. You know what I mean? It's like your car sitting in idle and then your car is going like a hundred miles an hour on the freeway. Like it's, it's that kind of a difference. You just get overwhelmed with the abundance of it. It's not that it was out of you or away from you necessarily. It was just that <clears throat> when we, when we use the terminology, it the, got hit with the Holy ghost. Um, it's a slang. It's, it's a Christianese. There's no doubt about it. Uh, especially in the Pentecostal and apostolic world, four square churches, we use it as well, but it's a, um, it, it's, it's definitely a, a, a overwhelming, a, like I can't control myself anymore because the Holy spirit is just like so strong in me. So that's what we mean by that. Yeah. And if one example I can think of right now, let's say you're driving a car and you're looking out the window and you're doing your thing driving a car next to you, the passenger seat, there's someone. If you were to stop for a second driving that car and just stare at that someone, you would be much more, I don't know, conscious of their presence. That's kind of like what kind of like what the Holy Spirit is like. Always there in the passenger seat, so to speak. But if you were to Stop and look at it. Look at him. Spend some time like being there. You'd start to suddenly see it more and more and more of it. And at some point, you may want to get out of the car and let the Holy Spirit drive. Amen. Pretty cool. Um, yeah. Just, just hope that the Holy Spirit doesn't start driving while you're actually driving. 
because that, that can't yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take this analogy as literal that you should be driving and having a and having a Holy Spirit experience at the same time. That might not be very. And sometimes you don't get to choose, but luckily I, I've never been hit with the Holy Ghost, meaning the overwhelmed sensation while driving. Uh, but I could imagine if I did, I'd have to pull over very, very quickly. Yeah. So. Okay, um, moving on. Okay, moving on. Ricardo, general comment on Psalms. Uh, just read it. Okay. Uh, candy can do. Psalms. Who wrote Psalms? Or who's speaking and talking in Psalms? What does Selah at the end of the passages mean? I looked it up. It says Selah is defined in a, as a Hebrew word that has been found at the ending of verses in Psalms and has been interpreted as an instruction calling for a break in the singing of the Psalm, or it may mean forever. Being that I didn't, it didn't really answer the answered for me i thought i'd ask and see what you have to say is psalms meant to be sung instead of being read thank you um go ahead nathan you want to you want to you want to handle selah well they were originally songs yes. yeah so they, they would sing them uh we don't know the music that goes with it though and english doesn't rhyme as the hebrew probably did or whatever even if it did rhyme and salah the way that they use it is kind of like a way of saying amen like an it's like a total agreement and that's really what the word amen means too. I don't know if a lot of people actually know what amen means, but it means like uh, when I talked to a rabbi about it when I was in Messianic Temple, I was like, I was like, how do you guys use uh, uh, amen? And they kind of they say it differently than we do. And, and they were like, well, it means like we, I agree with my soul. And I was like, ah, like a, a total soul agreement is what amen means. I was like, ah. So salah is kind of like, from what I understand, it means also the kind of the same thing as on, but in a song. Guys, look at these comments right now. Your comments are so amazing. Look at everybody testifying about their experience of the Holy Spirit. Look at that. I know, Just I love take it. a look it's at true. that. Like how how much of that is happening in the world today? I can exactly. only hope. Lots. And how many people aren't experiencing it? And 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 if they just could have one experience. Oh my gosh, they'd be they'd be addicted. I hate that word, but that's the truth of the matter. Changed. Like how many of us? It's, yeah, they they just be completely changed. Be changed. That's a better word. But like all yeah. of us oh have been gosh. changed. Woo hoo! Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Amen. So yeah, psalms Song. are songs and uh, poems, and uh, they're meant to be played. Yeah, musical music. You said all that, right? Okay, moving on. Yeah, or you can rap them. You can rap them too. You just have to <laughs> oh, have a DJ. And as far as who's this. speaking or talking, oh. it'll it'll say at the top of the <laughs> psalm usually, it'll say, you know, a psalm of David, and you can pretty much uh, yeah. guess that it's David writing. Not, not always, but when you take a look at the context of what it's talking about, you can kind of figure it out. I think there's only like a four people that they believe wrote the psalms, David obviously being one of them, Solomon being another one. I think there is a female who is one of the writers as well. It might have been Esther. I can't remember who it was. Ruth, maybe? I don't know. Uh, and then uh, there's another person who I'm blanking on right now. But yeah. Do you know Alex? Uh, if there's another author in Psalms? Yeah, I think Solomon may have had a couple. I said Solomon. Oh. Are you not no, listening? No, I'm to totally me? not listening to you right now. On? Alex am... is going to tell me to tell you guys who wrote Psalms in two seconds. <laughs> I'm, reading, <laughs> I'm reading the comments right now because people are just testifying to their experience of the Spirit, and it's awesome. I'm just I can't I can't help myself but, I know, be, but be reading that. Um, yes, Asaph. I, I think Asaph did have Moses. I'm not sure. Did Moses write some songs? I, I don't know. Possible. Well, we'll get there if we, if he did. Um, let's keep going. Uh, Candy, I hope that answered your question. Sabrina Gailas. At first, I thought that most of these psalms are made as we know, singer songwriter these days. Um, that they are thinking about the lyrics they're going to make in a particular song. But a few weeks ago, I heard something interesting. Probably most of the Psalms were written in the tabernacle that David had placed, see 2 Samuel 6.17. Quote, they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it, and David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. In the tabernacle were persons who were filled with the Holy Spirit and sang songs that the Holy Spirit gave them. Others sat next to these individuals and wrote their words down. This makes sense if you look closely at the meaning and text of some of the Psalms. I think not all of these could have just been invented by man alone. Many are familiar with the tabernacle of Moses and the temple of Solomon, but are not familiar with David's tabernacle. God has not promised to restore the tabernacle of Moses or the temple of Solomon, but he has promised to restore the tabernacle of David to recover. 
Hmm. Mm. Is it to recover or did you mean forever? To establish forever. Yeah. Maybe it's a typo or autocorrect or maybe you meant to recover. But very interesting mm. point, Sabrina. Um, yes. You can't, I, reading it this time through, uh, I can't deny the fact that there's prophecy. There's there's Everyone. stuff about Yeshua in there. There's, I mean, it's on it's it's next level stuff in there, that are definitely not a bunch of dudes. Pardon my French. Who just got together and decided, hey man, let's write a hip song about God. Right. It's way way too deep and inspired for that to be and the case detailed. and detailed. It, it's so it's so dead on that like the odds. I mean. Yeah, granted, Yeshua knows, you know, everything by the, when he gets here in the flesh, so he can just recall their songs. But the application, you'll notice when we get to the New Testament and you, and you read what Yeshua, when he quotes Psalms, the application is the very scenario where it prophesies he will say this to people who behave like this, have these characteristics. He's going to say this to them. And then there's Yeshua saying it to those people with those characteristics. It's like that you can't, like, no matter how much you try to set something up, that's that's. Ooh, no. I love the next comment, Rianne Williams. Um, there are bits throughout the Psalms where the writers make statements in the first person about their own righteousness, and these bits have always made my toes curl. For example, in some of David's Psalms, he says, "My steps have held to your path; my feet have not slipped," which we know not to be the case. Or judge me according to my righteousness, the idea of which terrifies me. <laughs> the only way I have ever been able to read these without feeling boastful or wrong is to read it as if Jesus is the one speaking. Is now is this how we're supposed to read these Psalms, or are we supposed to be able to pray from our received righteousness this boldly? It's a great question, Rianne. You pick up on something we definitely picked up on and uh um, and we talked about we it. We did yeah. talk about it, and I'll let you go ahead, Nathan. I'll let you talk about that. So uh, this is the reason why I think, as Alex stated, that it's really important to read all the books that are before Psalms, before Psalms, before you read it. Because if you did read this, you would think that that what David is saying is a right thing to do. Like how many people have quoted Psalms, and just because it's a sentence in the Bible, they think, oh, this is a thing I should be thinking. This is the way I should be thinking. What most people don't understand is that that's why I say you have to look at the totality of the Bible. When David starts writing, look at my righteousness, Lord, look at my goodness, I'm seeing Job. I'm seeing the beginning of Job. Now, now we understand that Job didn't quote unquote sin. And at this point in the storyline, David had not yet, not yet sinned either. It sounds like, and what you mean by that is it sounds like this is the time where he's being chased by, by Saul. Right, which we know because he talks about being chased by somebody who wants to kill him and that he's being righteous and not killing this guy. And uh, and he goes, so what is all my good doing when I'm just going to end up dead and this guy's going to you know, be all glorious, blah, blah, blah. And then as you get through the Psalms, as you guys get to the teens, you start to notice that he goes, oh, you redeemed me. You 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 brought me through. You, you brought down my enemies. Like you're basically seeing the story of David as the Psalms are being written. And as his life is unfolding, it's kind of like a journal. So Psalms shouldn't be taken as word. One single sentence in it is the word of God. The totality of the experience of the individual's walk with God is the, is, is the, is the message of God. So we all get to a point, maybe all, I don't know, maybe some of us don't, but at least Job and David in the situation got to a point where they were like, I'm good, I'm not making any mistakes, you should love me, Lord, because I love you, and I'm following all your commandments, so you should bless me. <clears throat> and then he even says, you should destroy my enemies, you should crush them, you should kill them, right? So one of the things that, that, that sticks out to us is that we clearly see that David and Job at one point stand on their own righteousness, and God allows both of them to enter into a place in their life, uh, a season in their life, where they sit there and they are shown by God's chastisement that just because you're walking right with God doesn't mean you don't have growth. You don't have more to go. And when we get to that place where we go, I'm righteous, I'm good, I'm right with God, everything is good with God, God goes, so you're going to stop? Like, you, I'm, you know, I'm God. You really think that, like, you've reached the plateau of relationship with me? And so 
we should not take we should not be taking passages and cherry picking them and just saying oh this sounds sweet or this makes me feel good because we will miss the actual true context of the entire message of the bible and especially here in psalms we shouldn't take the first couple of of psalms that where a man is saying how wonderful he is and how God should show him favor because of his great deeds and his holiness. We shouldn't take that and apply it to ourselves because we learn later that God humbles him, <clears throat> allows him to sin, allows him to fall from grace, and then even sends uh, prophet Nathan to uh, allow him to confess his own his own wrongdoing. I mean, so so you look at the totality of it. Really great question. I hope I'm making sense. I'm just trying not to give away a lot of stuff at the same time yeah I, you're, I, th I think you're making sense and Rianne I think you know it's great that you're picking up on the fact that when he speaks of his own righteousness it doesn't feel quite right quite right it's and and that's what we're saying that's what we're picking up on is what's beautiful about the Psalms is once you understand where they lie in the rest of the events of David's life you can see that he's exactly. a human just like the rest of us and that the Lord gave him tremendous favor before uh, David was truly humble and understood that, you know, he's just yeah, everything, everything there is to, everything there is to boast about was really not his doing. And, um, you know, and it was actually the sin, it was sinning and falling from uh, his sort of I am sinless kind of position that gave him even greater wisdom and greater love, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it's important. And, you know, and again, it points to Yeshua. Amen. And, and you guys, just so you know, the New Testament is going to, you guys are going to notice the New Testament is the same. There are passages in the New Testament that if you, if you just took the passage, just one, one, there's a particular passage, I won't tell you which it is, but there's a particular passage that if you followed the commandment of this passage from this apostle, you would actually be sinning. So why why is this passage in the Bible? Because it talks about how this particular apostle was, was lying. And it, it tells us, the Bible tells us that he was lying and, and misteaching and misguiding the people after the Holy Ghost, after the the fiery tongues, and after Yeshua ascended. This was this was later on when he was a seasoned leader of the apostles. And, and he lied on what we were to do, and the Bible tells us later that that was a lie and that he was lying to everybody. If you didn't read the rest of the Bible and you only took that single passage and you only followed that passage, you would have not known from the later passages that that was an example of how we're human. That even the apostles, even after they got the Holy Ghost, even after they reached their total status of apostleship and everything, they were still making mistakes. So be aware of this i mean this this is the reason why we must read the totality of the bible and must take it as a whole and and, and allow it to to unfold and unravel and unlock us okay so box done. no it's very good i mean essentially again both things are true yes david was exemplary before quote unquote maybe his days of extra wisdom david yes david was special when he was writing about how special he is but at the same time right he was what he was in pride essentially there was there was a pride about it perhaps and so right but but, but let not, me try my, not calling so, him a sinner so for it either i'm just simply no, saying no no i know but, so he's so he's special so he's wonderful so he has favor so he killed goliath so he atoned so he danced naked for god every morning you know he does all these wonderful things how do, so i'm not talking bad about david goliath, but my point is is this so he doesn't have to grow anymore. Right. He doesn't have further growth. He doesn't have further revelation to come. That's the danger. When we get to a place where we see the favor of God around us, when we get to the place where we are comfortable and we see that God is providing, that God is giving, that God is protecting, and we go exactly as the Israelites did. This is why, this is why if you do read Psalms out of context, Right? We see that the Israels got protected. They got provided. They got Jerusalem. They won every war. They took down cities just by marching around and blowing a ram's horn. Right, They were given so much glory and honor and wonderfulness because of the grace of God. And then they just like, they're like, yeah, we're done. We're good. We don't have to grow anymore. We're, we don't have to move anymore. We don't have to be grateful anymore. We deserve where we're at. 
because we have done what God has asked us to do. We marched around the city. The walls came down. That was because we listened to God and did what he said. So now we can go do whatever we want. And that's, that's, that's the thing is like when these folks get to a place where they get so blessed that they go, I got it. I'm where I need to be. This is it. That's the danger zone. And that's the lesson here. And you would not be able to perceive that if you didn't read the whole thing leading up to this point. Does that make sense, Alex? Absolutely. And, you know, okay. um, yeah, yeah. Just take for granted. Sharon said yeah, it. Well, Human nature is to take it for granted. Yeah. Exactly. And when, when I, you know, pride is one of those things. I, I don't ever blame anybody for, for, for pride, really, because it's an invisible sin. When you are in pride, you really have a hard time seeing it, <laughs> you know, yeah. and uh, as you guys have heard me say many times, the danger of pride is that it doesn't know it's prideful. Yeah. It thinks it's humble and right. <sighs> David, oh. David is awesome. Okay. Yes, David's awesome. Um, so here we go. First chapter, Psalms number one. Woo, 47 mm -hmm. minutes in. Here we go. Rudy Barlon. Oh, um Psalms 1 1 Blessed is the man who doth not who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of the mockers. In Matthew 5 3 it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit of their kingdom. I'm sorry, blessed are the poor in spirit of theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As I look at this at these two blessedness, um, there seems to be a subtle difference. They're achieved or attained on different grounds. The blessedness of palm of palms, the blessedness of Psalms one one, requires one to do or not do something, but the blessedness of Matthew five one to twelve is bestowed upon people who are in certain conditions, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who hunger for righteousness, etc. The blessedness of Psalm one prescribes some actions to take to attain blessedness while the blessedness in matthew 5 describes some conditions of people who are blessed in psalm 1 the blessedness seems to be earned while the blessedness of matthew 5 is a gift ephesians 2 8 through 9 summarizes it for by it for by it is for by it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not works, so that no one can boast. Yeah. Hmm. Are you looking at me? I'm just. I don't have. I don't have a canary in my mouth yeah. again, like you always say. <laughs> good comment. Yeah. Very good. I'm, um, I'm just trying to be quiet so that you can get through all okay. the comments. All right. <laughs> I'm biting my tongue. Uh, you have something to say? Then say it because... Good comment. No. no. I don't, right. That was good. Okay. I mean, it's good. All right. Uh, uh, Rudy Barlon continues in Psalm 1, verse 1 through 2. In these two verses, the psalmist prescribes what not to do and what to do to be blessed. In the prescription of what not to do, I noticed a progression leading to the fall. It uses three related positions of movement, walk, stand, and sit. First is the walking in the counsel of the ungodly. It is the beginning. My sources, my source say that this means listening to their counsel. Second is stand in the way of the sinners. Some translations say that this means standing around with sinners. And third is sit in the seat of the mockers. The progression is then listening to the ungodly, stand around sinners, and finally joining the mockers in what they do. This implies to me that if we do not do the first, we will likely not do the next two. If we do not listen to the counsel of the ungodly, we're likely not to stand around them and finally not to join them. And to avoid listening to the counsel of the ungodly, we need to listen to the counsel of God by delighting in the law of the Lord and meditating in it day and night. The law of the Lord will lead us to the way of righteousness and lead us away from the ungodly. There will be no place for the counsel of the ungodly. When we have the law of the Lord, we got all the counsel we need, and going anywhere else will never come to mind. The EBRT uh -huh. is facilitating this for me. Thank you, Nathan and Alex and every member of the group. Well, Rudy, thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise um, the Lord. And, and, and indeed, this is 
this I would certainly hope that if there's a council of the ungodly, this is not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're not doing a very good job by telling people to go to the Bible if that's the case. Right, right. <laughs> um, go, go read the Bible for yourself. But wait, that's counsel of the ungodly. Yeah. Which I've been accused of, by the way, many a times. This guy's a blasphemer. This guy's a false prophet. Blah 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 blah. Um, I'm like, oh, what what part of telling people to read the Bible for themselves is sin? People can't read the Bible for themselves. They have to have a priest or a pastor tell them what it means. I'm pretty sure you just blasphemed, but I'll get off that soapbox. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, very, very good dichotomy. But uh, or you're you're picking up some awesome things here, Rudy. Um, let's keep going. There's probably more to say. Mm -hmm. Let's keep going. Ricardo, Psalms one two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. The word for Lord is Jehovah, and the word for the law is Torah. That is also the Pentateuch. For me, Pentateuch is the first five books. For me, it takes more importance when you change those words. But his delight is in the Torah of Jehovah. And in his Torah doth he meditate day and night. I like that, Ricardo. Because the law mm -hmm. sounds like this immovable sort of like the law. One must follow the law or there will be punishment. Whereas the Torah... Yeah, it sounds like a tyrant with a with a hammer and a sickle or whatever it's with a hammer and the you know the judge thing too. yeah you know what I'm talking about. exactly whereas the torah is actually a, a totality of this awesome story of creation and and the people who had faith in the lord and tried to follow in his footsteps yeah um, come on out much well going, much, buddy? I like it. much more much Crazy. more much more what's the word i'm looking for i guess inspiring to consider rather than than the word law the law i know the word law is very i mean unless you're talking about the ten commandments the word law is kind of it's very misleading in a way because it's not it's not like a law where you like you must do this or be punished it, actually the, the law of god does the exact same opposite or does the exact opposite call to action god does not say do or i will punish you god says please do so i can continue to bless you even in in the Leviticus and in, 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 in Numbers, when he's giving the law to Moses, he's saying, you are my people. You have not done anything for this. Abraham did. You haven't done anything to deserve this. I have already chosen you. You are my people. I want to continue to bless you. So here is what I'm going to offer you. It's not the other way around. I am this big, mean guy in the sky with a magnifying glass, and you are ants. And if you don't want to be fried by my son magnifying glass, then you have to do this. So it's yeah, I'm I'm really glad that this got pointed out because you know Ricardo uh, it breaks my heart. Ricardo, I'm gonna drop the mic for you because believe it or not, uh, I have not actually looked up the word law. I don't remember looking up the word law until right now, and indeed you're right, it's Torah, and that's just a whole in this circumstance. In, in this circumstance. In this circumstance. In other circumstances, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I had not. It may, it may, in other circumstances, it, it literally means, means law. Okay, I, I feel I feel less like a bad student right now. <laughs> starting starting to worry. I was like, wait, have I not looked the word law up the rest of the time we've been reading? So I feel less like a bad student. Thank you, but but indeed, it is important that it should say Torah here. Yeah. See, see, a little translation helps. Yeah. A little translation gets a little clarity. Oh man. I get so excited. And so yeah, but his delight is in the Torah of Jehovah, and in the Torah mm. does he meditate day and night. I mean, that's mm. that's a whole different thing than than let's, the Lord. law is literally what it's it's Deuter it's uh it's uh Leviticus. Leviticus? That would be just Deuteronomy. Numbers. Yeah, or there's, there's laws in each of them. Yeah, but Leviticus is the one that's sort of like okay, this is the book of the law. Right. This is the book of the law. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Awesome word, Ricardo. Okay, Sabrina Gailas, one, two. Uh, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and the law does he meditate day and night. The word law here in Hebrews Torah. Thank you, Sabrina, picked up on the same thing. This psalm is about the things, um, what the Torah is about. These are the first five books in the Bible. In Eastern meditation, the goal with meditation is to empty the mind. This is dangerous, because an empty mind may present an open invitation to deception or a demonic spirit. But in Christian meditation, the goal is to fill your mind with the word of Jehovah. This can be done by Damn. carefully thinking about each word and phrase, 
applying it to oneself and praying it back to the Lord. This sort of meditation is different than the New Age meaning and goal of meditation. Many lack because they only read and do not meditate. It is not only in reading that does us good, but the soul inwardly, inwardly feeding on it and digesting it. That way you get mm. really soaked with him. Uh, mm. I see that there's a quote to that uh, last sentence. Um, so I'm wondering where it came from, but that's cool. That's really awesome, Sabrina. Yeah, meditate meditate on the word of the Lord is so important. Yeah, so important. Well done. Bravo on that comment. Love it. Um guys getting so excited. Know, that's awesome. Shut up. Sabrina Gilas one three. That brings forth its fruit in its season. The righteous man bears fruit, such as the fruit of the spirit, Galatians five. Uh the fruit comes naturally from this tree because it is planted by the rivers of water. It is abiding in a life source. As Yeshua spoke of bearing fruit in John 15, 5, as we abide in him, fruit also has a season. It's easy sometimes to get discouraged when you begin to walk as a righteous person and fruit is not immediately evident. Sometimes we need to wait until we bring forth fruit in its season. This isn't always as easy as it sounds. I learned that out on my own. Uh, I learned that out of my own experiences. Yeah. This is true. This, this is, is very true. Speak the truth. Uh, speak of the truth. And you know, it's funny. I find sometimes, you know, I kind of get to a point inside very quietly where I go, I don't know. There's just a, there's like a fruit I've been missing and something I've been lacking and, and, and or something. I just, I want that connection. I want this new revelation and it doesn't come for a few days. And then suddenly something hits when I've forgotten about being sad about not having it. Talk about seasons. Um, does mm -hmm. that make sense, Nathan, what I just said? Yeah, and you just hit on something that I often I often encourage people and, and, and try to explain. The time I hear from God the most is when I don't want anything. Yeah. So what you said is is that you, you want this fruit, you're craving this fruit, and that's not a bad thing. But you 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 just confess that the time that you get hit with the revelation and you get and you and the fruit comes into you is when you had forgotten about it and were no longer sad that you didn't have it, right? Yeah. Because what when you're sad about not having it, and, and I know this is going to be kind of weird and hard for some people to hear, you have to understand, like, when you are upset that the Lord hasn't given you revelation yet, you're literally in a way saying that God's not doing something right. You're literally saying that God's timing is wrong, right? So in a way, you're almost accusing God of, like, being broken or making a mistake and that you know better. Well, Lord, I should have this answer already on this prayer. My circumstances are dire and I need you to answer me now. Right. It's like, so it's when we, it's when we surrender and we go, okay, my life is broken. I'm broken. There's nothing I can do. God doesn't seem to be answering me. And you surrender to the circumstance and you let go of the wanting and the craving. And then you're just in this state of like, I can't, and this may sound negative, but you're in a state of, I can't care anymore. And then all of a sudden, God answers. So I, I, I can't encourage people enough to, to, to really meditate on these words. Be still and know that I am thy Lord, thy God. Like be in confidence that I'm seeing you, I'm hearing you, and I am your God. God, like I am the God. So let me be the God. You know what I mean? Just be still chill i got you you know and having that faith is hard obviously you guys saw me cry like a month and a half ago two months ago because i had to ask for donations so you guys know what i'm talking about uh, we, we all have it so we don't get to beat ourselves up about it either he's a work we're all a work in progress and that's what's so beautiful about it may we all continue to grow Hallelujah. rudy barlon in verses one three through four the blessed man and the cursed sinner are contrasted by two unrelated metaphors rather than using the metaphor of living versus dead tree the psalmist used a tree and a chaff. The blessed man is compared to a living tree planted by streams of water, while the cursed sinner is compared to a completely useless chaff. This drives the point that there is a great, great difference between being blessed and being cursed. The blessed man produces fruit in season. I take this to mean that in every circumstance the blessed man finds himself in, he produces the fruit appropriate for each particular situation, as listed in Galatians 6, 22-23. 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The psalmist mm. concludes the blessing of the blessed man by saying that whatever he does prospers because the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. This is where I want to be and hope to be. Amen, Rudy. Amen. Amen, Rudy. Amen. Um, a very good point, though, about the fact, about again, about the seasons, the seasons. Mm -hmm. Things happening is good, but things happening in the right time is really what we always want. That's where the blessing right. comes. Um, and who controls the seasons? The Lord Almighty. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, Ricardo, Psalms 1-3, blessed, I just read it. Uh, oh, no. Uh, yes, 1-3. through three. Um, I just read all that. Um, uh, all this said has a prophetic sense when thinking about Yeshua. Yeshua was the only one who walked the earth without sin, in perfect harmony with his spirit and his will, and lived by the law fulfilling all prophecies. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Reference to the tree of life in Eden or New Jerusalem. Is Yeshua like the tree of life? His leaf also shall not wither. If Yeshua is like the tree of life, leaves of the tree that not wither is a reference to saved souls without sin. Yeah. I, or, or, or save souls that won't be doomed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeshua being the tree of I life, I think about. that's very, uh, very right on, I think. Yeah, he does say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. And that's another thing, too. If, if you only read the New Testament, you came across that sentence, how the heck would you understand what he's talking about? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Is he saying only his life matters? Well, in a way, he kind of does. But you know, no, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you don't understand the poetry of it. You don't understand what, he's, what he means by that reference is what I'm saying. Sabrina Gailas, 1-4. <laughs> the ungodly are not so. It may often seem like ungodly and unrighteous people have all the good things, and sometimes it seems they have them more than the righteous. But it is not so. Any of these things are fleeting in the life of the ungodly. It can be said that they don't really have them at all if they don't have Yeshua. You can have all the wealth and wisdom in the world, but if you don't have Yeshua, you truly have nothing. Word, Sabrina, agreed, 100%. Word, for sure. Because all of those things will pass away, but his word will never mm -hmm. pass away. That's right. Uh, you can't take it with you, as they say, you know. Um, Fannis Prinsloo. Unless it's Holy Ghost treasures uh, up in heaven right. and they're waiting for you. Woo -woo. That's right. That's right. That's right. Fannis uh, Prinsloo. Uh, I, I almost said palms again. What's wrong with me? Psalms 1.5, uh, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in, in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Please explain how is it possible that the ungodly will not stand in judgment. Well, let's look up the word judgment, because I remember seeing that too and going, what does that mean? They mean does that mean they won't be judged? But no, I think in judgment means in found, in like, in good judgment. Um, yeah, mishpat. Mishpat, let's see. Um, verdict, favorable or unfavorable, pronounced judicially, especially a sentence or formal decree, including the act, the place, the suit, the crime, and the penalty. Abstractly justice, including a particular right or privilege. Is this the same one? So, in order to understand this passage, you have to do what? Even as a on. hold on, I'm I'm just reading the concordance here. Um, okay, go ahead, Nathan. What were you saying? No, no, no read it. I'm no, I, I've I've read I've read all of the concordance uh, for the for the word judgment, and it does sound it's judgment. It is does sound yeah. like judgment. Right. So it's one of those passages again that sound like it contradicts the Bible. So what do we got to do? Well, I think we need to. I think we read the passages that come before it. Yes. Uh, hold on. Yes. Boom. It's not hard. Rise. No. Okay. Here it is. Uh, the the word the the word that comes right before judgment stand it means to rise. It it actually means to like stand up and 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 so 
to me it sounds like they you know they'll be cut down by the judgment does that make sense yeah but let's read that's what i'm saying yeah. so let's read the passages that come before okay it. the ungodly because i believe that you just hit, you just hit the nail on the head but understand the sentence yeah, you have yeah. to understand yeah, yeah. what so, the reference to what the person is saying um I'll just start with Psalms 1-3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall also not wither, and, whithersoever, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are... Okay, I'm going to stop you. I'm going I'm to stop you. Go to the first one. Go to the first one. Okay. Go all the way back. All right, Psalm 1-1. Blessed is the man yeah. that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. Why, why is that so important that I had you read that sentence? To the reference of the question she's asking, right? Notice how that first sentence sets up the whole foundation, right? So when I say you got to read the whole chapter, you got to read the whole context, right? Like, I mean the whole thing, you know, don't go back to just a half passage. Don't go back a few passages. Go back to the whole thing because it's a, it's a total thought. So that's, that's what I'm saying. I agree. All right, continue I agree. on. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the Torah of Jehovah, and in the Torah doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So it sounds like if we're using the analogy of chaff and tree, a tree will stand. Mm -hmm. A tree will stand up and it will have deep roots and it will not be brought down by the wind or the judgment of the Lord. And uh, mm -hmm. sinners not being in the congregation of the righteous, it just talks about walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. So, um, yeah. It. So, so, so does it read like, do you guys, you guys tell us, does it read like to you that it's saying the people who are righteous are people, so when it talks about running waters, right? Yes, the running water is coming by a tree. It gives it nourishment because it's, it's water all the time. But also rushing waters later is used also, or even earlier is used as, you know, when the rushing waters come, the tree will be knocked over. If a house is built on a rock, when the rushing waters come, the house will stand. And that is a, a man who built his house on the word of God. Those who built their houses not on the word of God build their houses on sand. And when the rushing waters come, the house shall be destroyed. So in this circumstance, it sounds, it sounds like to me, I'm, I'm not trying to give you guys, you know, two cents here, but uh, I don't want to try to feed you and tell you what the scriptures say. But when, when you take the one sentence, it says that the, that the, the ungodly or the bad people will not stand in judgment. But that's not what it's saying. It's saying they won't be able to stand after judgment. They won't be able to hold their head up. They won't make it through their judgment. They're going to be, as Alex said, when he started to read the passages backwards before it, it sounds like they're going to get cut down by the judgment and they won't be able to spring back up. They won't be able to produce fruit afterwards. So there's one fire. There is a fire of God. And for those who are righteous and seek the will of God and seek to humble them, find by the fire and the dross will be removed from them and they shall be pure and they shall be stronger and they shall be cleaner but for those who do not seek to do the will of god but they seek to do evil and they seek the counsel of evil and they do not consider the ways of the lord as the bible words it those people when the fire comes they will be consumed we will actually see this very very verbiage this very wording used from yeshua when we get to the new testament and if you want to look at it now after today, you can look for uh, Google uh, or, or search in your Bibles for when Yeshua talks about um, those who do not produce fruit uh, will be thrown in the fire. Uh, and those who are cowards will be considered as amongst those who are unbelievers and they shall be thrown in the fire. So for one, fire is, is refinement and strengthening and, and, and growth. And for another, fire is destruction. So hopefully that this is why it's so important to look at the totality you can't just look at one sentence word yvette davis uh responded to that saying i meditated on this one as it stood out to me too. see my answer also looking forward to hear what others have to say so 
very good you guys you're you know this is actually very happy we're having this discussion so a lot of people picked up on a seeming contradiction that and sandy vickers also says and i believe sandy you real-time commented said oh i got it uh so is this maybe another one of those seemingly contradicting verses corinthians yes. uh two uh second corinthians five ten. for we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And Psalms 1.5, therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. I don't have e-sword for the life of me. I will figure out how to pay for it on my iPhone <laughs> one of these days. Uh, and Linda Eli writes, Sandy, it may be that we in Second Corinthians refers to the followers of Yeshua and not the wicked to the church of God that is at Corinth with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, 2 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. And then Dina Christu writes, I think they're talking about two different things. If you read the whole of Psalms 1, you'll see that it talks about how one goes about to obtain blessedness and how the ungodly are like the chaff and the wind drives them away. They shall not be able to stand or endure the judgment of God. 2 Corinthians 5 describes our bodies being like tents, temporary, dwelling, temporary dwellings, and how we have a heavenly dwelling with Yeshua, but we also have <coughs> to appear before the judgment seat and held to account. Very brief summary, <coughs> but if you read the whole two chapters in totality, you'll see the difference. Just my two cents worth. Very good, Dina. We agree. Damn. You nailed it. Um uh <clears throat> Rian Williams to Sandy Vickers, I think the Corinthians verses are saying we will all be judged. There is a reference later in Corinthians that says the saints will judge the world. So the Psalms quote is saying those who don't belong to God will not judge over others, I think. Interesting. Interesting idea there, too. Um, uh, okay, very good. Sabrina Gailas, 1-6. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous... But the way of the ungodly shall perish. At least four times in the book of Acts, people who follow Yeshua is called the way. Certainly, it is the way of the righteous, not the way of the ungodly. It is important to consider and reflect our own actions in time and to think to ourselves, am I doing Jehovah's will? Am I a true follower of the way? Because we don't live for ourselves anymore if we're saved. Yeshua lives through us and we live for him. Amen. 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 amen amen exactly that's the key yeah and it's hard you guys it's hard it, it's it's not easy easier said than done for sure it's easy to say we oh i live for christ yeah i mean and we gotta wake up and we gotta do it but you know he he makes it possible as long as we're striving towards it progress day by day inch by inch uh yvette davis you've got a whole uh wonderful comment here about all of psalms one Verse 3 revealed to me that once we are rooted in Jehovah's ways, we will not fall away to our own mercy. We will not fall away to our own mercy. We start out as babies, well some of us do, and we might go through trials which could lead to sin or backsliding as I did after I was baptized the first time. God knows his children though and what we need and he knows how to handle us. We don't know anything which is why it is important to read his word. He wants us to be strong in his word and in him and rely on him only. This only happened to me after trials and sin because I had no clue at the beginning. <clears throat> Reading my Bible and praying a lot not only brought me back, but I am much more mature now with a lot more faith, not withering. One, blessed is the one who doth... Uh, yes, this is the three verses. And then verses four through six really stood out to me after meditating on it. I realized, at least for me, that the Lord seems to be saying, if we repent, we are forgiven. The wicked will not stand in judgment because they are not connected to Jehovah. Therefore, there is no repentance and no refinement. I believe this scripture is about trials that we go through in order for our faith to be strengthened. Sometimes our trials lead to sin, but God will use our sin to grow us and give us his wisdom when we return to him. This cannot happen without salvation. The wicked are the wicked are like chaff, easily deceived by their own ways. But again, God will accept any that come to him. Knock on the door and it shall open. So the wicked can be saved also. Anyone who wants to repent and follow Jehovah is accepted. So these verses to me are also a warning. 
That's a mic drop. Same me it is. Same, you gotta same mess. You gotta a mic drop. I, I will do it. Let me finish your comment. Okay. Same. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so excited. <laughs> you know me. I, uh, same message is in Proverbs 24, 16. For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again, but the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. I also found that passage to be really interesting, as Yeshua points out in Luke 17, 4, sinning seven times a day and forgiving seven times a day. This also seems to be a direct message to us that no matter how many times we fall, if we repent, we can be forgiven, but we must also forgive. In verse 5, the apostles are asking the Lord to increase their faith, which tells me again, if we get baptized, then we stumble. It is possible that the Lord is allowing it so that he can redeem us? This is why we need to forgive those who sin against us without judgment. Their sin might very well be the Lord's refinement for them and for us. Mm. As the body of Yeshua, we are all in it together. Luke 17, 4 through 6. Even if they sin against you seven times a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Well, bam. 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 And I love you, sure. How, how, yeah. He's so dope. Yeah. He's so awesome. Whew. Very well done. Very well said. Uh, hope, uh, mic drop for Yvette. Boom. Thank you, Yvette. Thank that you. was amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Continuing on, Psalms two. I love you guys' comments by the way now too. By the way, you guys are uh, you guys are totally hitting the nail on the head. So wonderful. Yeah. Um, Psalms two, Rudy Barlon. Psalms two. This chapter of Psalms seems to be talking about the person King David and prophetically the one of whom David is a shadow, the Lord Yeshua Hamashiach. If we look back at how David became king, he encountered so many oppositions before he fully established his kingdom. On the same token, the king of kings, the Lord Yeshua, encountered oppositions from leaders before he was exalted as king of kings. As it says in Acts 4, 27-28, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you have anointed. As it says in verse 4, the one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. All the nations who conspired against King David failed to prevent him from becoming king. And those who conspired against the Lord Yeshua all failed to restrain them from becoming restrain him from becoming the king of kings. Hallelujah mm -hmm. to the King of Kings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yvette Davis, Psalm 2, 1 through 3, reminds me of the king of Egypt refusing to let the Israelites go. Also, the Jewish leaders and Caiaphas plotting the arrest of Yeshua. Of course, of course, the world is still the same today. Look at how the enemy is using education and the media to turn people away from Yehovah. Spiritual warfare is intense. Really online, really online with what is happening in the world right now with, with this pandemic. Psalms 2, 1 through 3. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. Yeah, that's right. They want to be free of conviction and judgment and they want to do as they will. Mm -hmm. They see the Lord's, they see the Torah and they say, oh, those are just shackles in chains but that is a lie that's a barbaric that's a barbaric ancient religion made by evil people yeah and how much of a lie is that ladies and gentlemen how much of a lie is that huh horrible awful evil lie Fe i can't comment i'll just get upset i know right <laughs> you'll, you'll start you'll 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 you'll, you'll start I'll raging and you'll mess up your new or not so new you'll I'll mess up your truck don't do it. I'll, I'll, I'll go. I'll go Samuel. Yeah. On people. Yeah. I know. I know. Keep the sword away. Fannis Prinsloo, okay. Psalms two two. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, "Week after week, it is like the timing of each section is written for today, this week." Exactly, Fannis. The Bible is what the living Word of God, isn't it? That's right. And it will never return void. Never. Uh, 
um, Rudy Barlon, Psalm 2, 3. The conspiring nations, the kings of the earth, and the rulers who gather together against the Lord say, let us break their chains and throw off their fetters. This implies to me that these conspirators feel that they are restrained by God through his decrees, laws, and statutes. They want to be free from any restriction. They're essentially saying, we don't want to be slaves of God. They want to do anything they want without restraint. However, they don't seem to realize that by doing so, they're blindly and freely following their natural human lusts and thus making their lusts their masters. They think they're free, but actually they're slaves to a master that will bring them down to hell. They are slaves of sin, Romans 6.16. Strictly speaking, there is no such thing as freedom. The only freedom we have is the freedom to choose which master we want to be slaves of. Righteousness exactly. or sin? God mm -hmm. or the devil? It's either or, mm -hmm. never both. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other, Matthew 6.24. Yes. Even when one thinks he's the master of himself, he's actually a slave to sin. And this is the great deception. To control us, the devil wants us to believe that we are in control of ourselves. This is the reason I daily surrender myself completely to God. My will, my desires, my thoughts, my emotions, and all that constitute me. Rudy, that's amazing and true and great word. Yes, may it be so for all of us. May it be so. Sabrina Gilas 2.4 He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Jehovah laughs because he sits in the heavens. He sits as the great king on a glorious throne. He isn't pacing back and forth in the throne room of heaven wondering what he should do next. Jehovah sits <laughs> in perfect peace and assurance and is always in control. It isn't an earthly throne he occupies. It is the throne of heaven with the authority over all creation. What does heaven have to do? What does heaven have to fear from earth? Nothing. That's right. Mm -mm. What was the best man could come up with back in the day? Let's build a, what did they want? The, to build a super tall tower and go there and, you know, stab God or something? Yeah. yeah they want to sounded, climb, climb to the heavens and kill God. Yeah, what a brilliant idea that was. Not. Okay. Yeah. Sabrina Gilas, too. <laughs> what? No, just what? Like, uh, not. It's here's the thing: is it's it's so ridiculous. I'm sorry. One second, just one second. Guys. Come on, go. It's such a it. ridiculous thought that they actually toiled. They dug rocks. They dug. They dug water. For, you know, pumps. And they did all this stuff, and and they built this tower, super super high in the sky. Over years and years, people broke their backs, broke their fingers, possibly you know, bent a nail here and there, like all sorts of horrible stuff happened because they literally thought they were going to kill God. Like, like what the heck, dude? How do you kill the thing that created the very stone you're digging up? Like, how dumb can you be? And then we see that today. People are just like, we're going to win. We're going to conquer. We're going to overcome. Da -da -da -da. We're going to make our ways. Like, you, you do realize, right, that you're like trying to overcome the thing that created the very thing you're trying to control like how does that brain process even happen yeah it's so scary i know it's like really silly stuff okay uh so alex knows how i feel about you sorry well aren't we all in love with what god's created okay uh sabrina kylas <laughs> two seven i will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. The following passage indicates that this is the Lord's anointed himself speaking, Yeshua. He will declare the decree that God the Father spoke to him. Begotten is also an important word. It stands in contrast to created. Yeshua was not created. Rather, he created everything that was created. See Colossians 1, uh, 16 through 17. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Begotten describes a relationship between two beings of the same essential nature and being. Booyaka. Yep. Um... I just I can't wait for us to, as Nathan says all the time, get in the New Testament and get to really chew on, 
you know, Yeshua and who he is and what we see and what yeah. we understand. And Right? You're going to have to mute me during those videos because I'm not probably going to be able to shut up. So. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'm going to be bouncing off the walls like one of those rubber balls that kids get out of the little turn the money to, yeah. you know? Bouncy um, balls. Bouncy ball. Mm -hmm. Bouncy balls. I'm going to be like a bouncy ball. I'm going to be all over <laughs> So. Ricardo, Psalms 2 7. I will declare the decree the Lord has sent unto me, thou art my son, the day have I begotten thee. Again, prophecy about Yeshua, Matthew 3 16 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Mm -hmm. Acts 13 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Yeshua again. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And of course, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, guys, there's David in, uh, you know, I don't know what, like almost, what they, probably almost close to a thousand years before Yeshua walked the earth, totally writing yeah. and singing songs about Yeshua. Come on now. Prophesying. Prophesying. Great detail. Yeah. Sabrina Gylas 2.8. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen of, for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. The Lord's anointed, Yeshua, holds the nations as his inheritance. He will rule over all nations, and all judgment is committed to him. See John 5.22. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. Revelation 11.15 describes an exciting cons consummation of this inheritance. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. He shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah and amen to that. Yeah. Yeah, I love Psalm 2. I mean, come on. We all loved all everything. But Psalm 2 was pretty epic, wasn't it? I'm trying to get to it right now. Yeah. In my, There's something in there I wanted to look at real quick. Yeah, well, we'll get there. Uh, Sabrina Gylas, 2-9. Um... Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. See Revelations 2.27. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, <laughs> even as I received of my father. And also Revelation 12.5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And Revelation 9.15. 19.15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. All these verses are talking about Yeshua. They sure are. They sure are, Sabrina. I'm an, I'm I'm persuaded that they are. I am persuaded I am pers that these verses are speaking of the same one who is Yeshua. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Oh, uh, Garrett Black, in real time, does anyone see my comment or was it blocked? Uh, Garrett, which comment? I don't know. I'd have to scroll back to see, but we're on a roll and we've got a lot of comments to get through, so forgive us if we yeah. miss something here in real time. Um, um, let's see, let's see, let's see, where was I? Uh, yeah, Ricardo, Psalms 2.9, thou shalt break him with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash him in peace like powder. Yep. Reference to a prophecy that God tells Jeremiah to say in a very visual way about the incoming calamities that were coming for the Hebrews, exile to Babylon and the destruction of the first temple. Jeremiah 19.11 And shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Even so I will break this people and this city, as one breaketh a potter's vessel. They cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury them in Tophet, till there be no place to bury. Isaiah 30, 14 makes reference to this too. He shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that there shall not be found 
in the bursting of it a shard to make fire from the hearth or to take water with all out of the pit. But also okay. a related passage of Revelations. But Revelation deserves context in this case, right? Um, don't know what you mean, Ricardo, but I think other people have picked up on the rod of iron and I tend to agree that the imagery seems to be consistent. I don't know if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Uh, Sabrina 2.12, the word blessed in Strong's Hebrew word Esher uh, in this last verse of Psalm 2 is the same as the first word of Psalm 1. So the unknown author of these two psalms ends with the same word that he started. Maybe there's more to it, yeah. I like how you put unknown in parentheses because we kind of feel like maybe we know uh, Yehovah know maybe or Yeshua or same thing. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? But bam. Um, yeah. Oh, I love the Rihanna's last. Rihanna's asking. Oh, go ahead. Rihanna's asking, We're, we are the broken pot so that his glory shines through. Where is that verse? Uh, is that here? I don't know that you just read it. Somebody you quoted it when you were reading somebody's comment, or is that just a metaphor? Somebody's uh, just being poetic. Oh, Jer what? Jeremiah? No. Uh, uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah seem to be describing the the breaking of is the breaking up of Judah and the destruction of the first temple. I think that's what Ricardo was picking up on. Um, no. I don't remember about the broken pots and the glory shining through. I don't remember reading it. Me neither. Okay. Um, there might be a passage like that in the Bible, though. So if anybody knows what uh, Rihanna's asking, then go ahead and comment. Um, uh, I was just going to say real quick, oh, Sabrina, you yes, you talk about 2.12, but also just real quick, I want to read 2.12 because it rocks. Kiss the sun lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little blessed are all they that put their trust in him come on i'm trying not to jump out of the car and do a holy ghost fire drill right now you have guys in the way i mean right doesn't that doesn't that sentence make you want to do that come on nathan go for it mm -mm, okay all right all right <laughs> If it, was at, if it was at it was at like a stoplight, I'd do it. But, but this guy sitting in his truck all by himself, and then all of a sudden he gets out. <laughs> Holy Ghost fire drill! Oh, Woo! Goodness. And in Garrett, yes, we see your comments, but comments are are going very fast, and Facebook blocks some of it. But we are seeing your comments. Okay, continue. All right, here we go. Um, Psalms three, uh, Sabrina. Uh, Sabrina Gailas, um, a specific instrument is used with each specific psalm. With this specific, with this specific instrument, the meaning and intention of the psalm was best expressed. David had knowledge of those things. Okay. Yeah. He's a uh, Ricardo, Psalms three. Can you guys explain the real meaning of the word Salah? Esword explains it as an instrumental pause without lyrics and only music like directions and how to sing the psalm but I have heard that some people use it in the same way as amen or hallelujah like a praising word yeah I think we talked about that early in the video and yeah I don't see any harm in taking it as an amen or a hallelujah like a, maybe it's like a, a singing yeah maybe it's like a singing kind of hallelujah or something or a pause to kind of like acknowledge what was said I don't yeah. know Unfortunately, it's not part of our culture, guys. So we'd have to go to the people who might still be using it as part of their culture yep. and really and, and watch them apply it. And then we would have a better understanding of it. So, yeah, maybe one day what we'll do is we'll find a we'll find a synagogue or a temple, Jewish temple to go a part of. And when they read the Psalms and they all say Salah, then we'll, we'll have a better understanding. Of it. We'll be able to share that. So it's how unfortunate is it, though, that that so much of this culture is not not with us so much of this stuff that, that we, we, we just so detached from because it hasn't been passed down to christians quote unquote you know the believers of yeshua don't know this stuff and and there is there is there is a separation of understanding there is a separation of connection to these words and this and this culture and and that's why yeshua said you guys have heard me say it a thousand times that's why yeshua said it is for the jew you worship a god you do not know 
is for the Jews to know who God is. Yeah, so, yeah. Rudy Barlon, Psalm 3, in 2 Samuel chapter 15, we read about how David fled from Absalom to save his life. In this psalm, we read about how David felt at the time when Shimei said to David, The Lord has repaid you for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. The Lord has handled the kingdom over, I'm sorry, the Lord has handed the kingdom over to your son Absalom. You have come to ruin because you are a man of blood. David cried out to the Lord, You are a shield around me, O Lord. You bestow glory on me and lift up my head. And the Lord answered him from his holy hill. He was able to lie down and sleep because God sustained him. He was able to lie down and sleep in peace, for he knows that the Lord makes him dwell in safety. Psalms 4 8. He did not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against him on every side. The Lord indeed delivered David in 2 Samuel chapter 18, even when his very life was threatened. David's confidence was in the Lord. He did not fear his enemies, but his fear was in the Lord. Yeah. Ricardo, Psalms 3, can you guys explain? Whoa, hey. Oh, I copied hey, a st- I copied a question twice. Excuse me. What a <laughs> Sabrina 38, the word salvation. Here's also translated in Nisord as Yeshua. Oh yeah. Indeed. Indeed, yeah. Sabrina. Well that's that, that that's one of the arguments of why I I, I always say I'd rather prefer the name Yeshua because it actually means Yahweh is salvation. Or is the name Iswis does not mean that. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. It's echoing. Echoing? Who's echoing? echoing. Oh, I'm not echoing. Are you echoing? Hold on. Don't talk. <laughs> Sabrina three eight. Salvation. Now it's echoing. No, it's echoing because I put it in my volume. Mm-mm. Okay, keep going. Okay, Ricardo, Psalms three two and Psalms three eight. Psalms three two. Uh, many there, many there be which say of my soul there is no help for him in God Selah the word help in Hebrew is H3444 Yeshua Yeshua. there might be a better choice to translate because it means salvation it would read like this Mm -hmm. many there be which say of my soul there is no salvation for him in God Selah a confirmation of this is Psalms 3.8 salvation belongeth unto the Lord Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. And if you change again, salvation for Yeshua goes like this. Yeshua belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Bam. And the Jews don't know Yeshua's Messiah? Come on. (sighs) Hmm. There's corruption about. Hmm. There's corruption. Have you read Job? Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Yvette Davis. Don't get me started. Yvette, Sorry. Yvette Davis, Psalm 3.8. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. What I got from this is that, the, is that only the Lord can deliver us. We cannot deliver ourselves, nor can any other man. He might speak to others through us, but man cannot save man also seems to be pointing to the coming of the Messiah and his crucifixion. When we accept that he died on the cross and took on our sins, we are delivered from ours. Word. Yep. True that. Psalms 4. Um, Karen Dell Cunningham, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast set me at large when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. When I first read this phrase, set me at large, I felt it felt like it meant something like, you've abandoned me, Lord, and caused me to wander aimlessly. But looking up the words, thou has enlarged me in Esord, it took on a whole different meaning in that the word means Rahab. Rahab, a primitive root to broaden intransitively or transitively, literally or figuratively, be an, be an n Oh, be an enlarge ing, uh, make room, make open wide. So now this is speaking to me that when we are in distress and seeking him, 
God is actually making more room for us and opening up mm. our hearts to receive more of him and making our steps more secure. I love this as it reminds me that he's always working for our good behind the scenes. And when we're suffering and are in distress, he's working on our behalf. So great is his love for us and his determination to never abandon us, even though it may feel that way at times. That's awesome, yeah. Karen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, and Mike John Reynolds. Reynolds. Wow, uh, John, lame. we're not reading. We're not reading live comments. We're reading comments that are left on the graphics. Uh, you guys, comments that are left on the graphics have priority because people spend the time to read and post on the graphic. And our and our goal for this the video series is to get to those comments. Uh, the live comments are great because it creates a real time fellowship. But we really need to get to the comments that people spent the time to to do the work and, and post so all the comments that alex are, is reading right now are not live comments so if that's what everybody's talking about or the few people who are saying i'm not seeing these comments or how come my comments not getting read it's because we're not reading the live comments right now we're reading recorded or or the post pre-posted graphic comments and if you guys don't know when you go to yeshua network you will see a graphic that says got questions and then it will have the bible passages that we'll be reading on sunday that's the graphic that you would post your your comments on to be read live today so that's how it works very cool uh sabrina guilas 43 the lord will hear when i call to him all of us should have the same assurance we should be confident that jehovah will hear every single prayer we make because he does when prayer seems ineffective it is worth it to take a spiritual inventory to see if there's a reason for unanswered prayer the bible tells us there are several possible reasons why prayer may not be answered not abiding in Yeshua, see John 15, 7. Unbelief, see Matthew 17, uh, 20 and 21. A bad marriage relationship, see 1 Peter 3 and 7. Uh, uh, unconfessed sin, see James 5, 16. Lying and deceitfulness, see Psalm 17, 1. Lack of Bible reading and Bible teaching, see Proverbs 28, 9. And trusting in the length or form of prayer, see Matthew 6, 7. Yes, or repetition of it too. Very, very cool. Excuse me. Yeah, very well. Forgive good me. breakdown. <clears throat> That's very helpful. I think. Even though Alex yawns. I, I only, I'm yawning because I think I had too much coffee. And then once that happens, I have the opposite effect happening to my... I know that's why I have to keep keeping it during the thing because if I don't, then my it's yeah. Hard. That's why I keep chugging on water because I can't control the yawns. No. Forgive me, I am not at all um, in a yawny mood. We're not we're not sponsoring any containers right now in this show. Buy one today, get a second one, fifty percent off. Just kidding, when it's on. <laughs> 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 that random fake uh, fake uh, commercial was brought to you by Yeshua Network. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh wait, there's more. <laughs> if, if you pur if you purchase now, um, we'll send you an extra one for free. Okay. Where were we? Rudy okay. Barlon. Who you're knows? The one, you're the one with the list. I'm the one with the if list. If you if you don't drive this ship straight, Alex, we're running into walls. But it's all on you. Oh man. <laughs> Um, I need to spike my no water with something else in that case. All right. Caffeine, Alex. Caffeine. Yes, that's what I meant. What did you think I meant? You can't say spike. Spike <laughs> with caffeine. Explain. You gotta explain what you're saying. I know that was that was oh, meant to be a sad. dumb joke. Okay, Rudy Barlon, yeah. Psalm four, one through five. In this verse, David is addressing three audiences. In verse 1, he's talking to God in prayer. And then in verse 2, he's talking to men, rebuking them for trying to destroy his reputation though their lies, through their lies and false accusations. And then in verse 3 and verse 4, it seems like he's talking to himself to calm himself down. He seems to be encouraging himself of what he knows about God, that God has set apart the godly for himself, and the Lord will hear when he calls. Then in verse 4, he's reminding himself not to sin amidst anger but to search his heart while silent in bed. I like this idea of talking to oneself. David did not put all the blame on other people, but he also took he also looked at himself and reminds himself of what he needs to do for his part in his particular situation. He checks his own attitude. 
the thing that it, the, the thing that most of us uh, lost control of when we are pressed into hard situations and we are stressed. I think this is the best way to control ourselves. We need to talk to ourselves as we sometimes do when we make a mistake and we become aware of it. Sometimes I find myself rebuking myself. Oh, Rudy, mm. what did you do that for? When I make a stupid mistake. I believe that if we talk to ourselves and correct ourselves, God would not need to do it for us. But, but mm. with the help of the Holy Spirit, I will talk to myself more often. Well, let me encourage you, Rudy. I talk to myself so much that I should probably be committed. Well, I would be yeah. had anyone seen me. I don't know. That's a terrible thing. I should Nathan, not be committed. Nathan, Nathan, we talk to each other, don't we? Yeah, yeah, we totally do. We talk all the time. Yeah, yeah, we talk to each other. <laughs> Great. That was a perfect way to illustrate that. Thank you, Nathan. Um, well, well, Nathan agrees with me. Yeah. So we, you know. We're in agreement with you, Rudy. All four of us. Me, Alex, Nathan, and... And Alex. Yeah, we're all in agreement. Alex, Nathan, yeah, and Alex, know. and Nathan, and Rudy, yeah. and Rudy. So all six people are in agreement that talking to oneself Probably. is a good idea. Uh, Psalms 5. Sabrina Gailas, 5-3. My voice you shall hear in the morning. David made it a point to pray in the morning. He did this because he wanted to honor Jehovah at the beginning of his day and set the tone for an entire day dedicated to Jehovah. I do that too. Yeah. I think that's the best way to start your day. Awesome, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Rudy Barlon. This is very important. David would pray in the morning before he started his day. He encouraged people to pray very early. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Oh, okay. I just thought I would re reiterate the importance yes. of prayer in the morning. Oh, yes, and your strange accent is not confusing anyone at all. <laughs> They're used to it by now. I am made used it to, to it. Decision. Oh, they probably are too. Uh, Rudy Barlon, yeah. Psalm 5.3. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. Generally speaking, there is no specified time to approach God to pray, but there's definitely some benefits in approaching God in the morning. It's during the day that we do our work, and our day starts in the morning. Dedicating our day to the Lord sets the tone for the entire day. We will be more aware of His presence in our life during the day. We can look forward to experiencing His new love, new mercies, new blessings, which are our strength as we face the challenges of the day. Each day is a new day unlike any other, and committing our day to the Lord gives us confidence of His help during the day. As one preacher said, while the dew is on the grass, let grace drop upon the soul. Yep, yeah, amen. Um, okay. Um, Rudy Barlon, uh, Psalm 5 9. This verse says, Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with destruction, their throat is an open grave. With the tongue they speak deceit. This is the essence of what the Lord Yeshua said in Matthew 12, 34. When he said, You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. The mouth reveals what's in our heart. The Lord Yeshua said in Matthew 7, 16, By their fruit you will recognize them. I like to believe that the fruit here does not only refer to the deeds, but also to words, because they are also the result of pro or product of what is in the heart. A man's righteousness or wickedness will, at one time or another, be revealed in his speech. Purify the heart, and the speech will be sound and clean as well. Only the blood of Yeshua can purify our hearts. Oh. Amen, Rudy. I agree that, uh, oh. that word and deed go hand in hand. Oh, look at that. That's like a triple, double, quadruple, uh, I don't know. Have you got something to say, or are you just confused by me? Okay. <laughs> I'm confused by me, too. I'm getting delirious. We're probably on, like, uh, word... You need a, maybe you need to start carrying snacks with you to, to, to get to, through this. To keep maybe. my mind uh, from completely... Give you power bars. Yeah, maybe, because... My mind is starting to like lose its ability to think. 
Um, anything else? Uh, real time? You got anything real time? No, no. Moving on. Mm, we're good. I, I mean, they're they're following along. They're right. All they're right. With us. Very good. Very good. They're flowing. They're vibing. Very good. Okay. Sabrina Guilas, five nine. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is the very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulchre. They flatter flatter with their tongue. David focused on what the wicked say as evidence of their wickedness. David understood that Yeshua said what Yeshu David understood what Yeshua said later in Matthew twelve thirty four, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The heart. Our righteousness exactly. or wickedness will sooner or later show up in our speech. I don't think many people understand how much power there is in our words. You better speak only positive words that build up and that bless others to speak the will of Yehovah. Yeah, Sabrina, that you know, the the Levitical laws had very specific speech laws. And those specific speech laws said exactly that. I mean, to speak, to speak the truth of someone else, but if that truth were to going to bring them down or be essentially gossip, even though it is true, was a sin, uh, according to those laws. And it doesn't mean a lie as a witness in the case of a judgment or in the case of a crime. No. In the, in the case of a court, in the case of people seeking out responsibility for something, you have to tell the truth. But in the case of like just talking about people, um, very, very clearly it says, don't even talk about them, well-meaning or not, say nothing. That's how, uh, you know, just just try to back up what, what, what is being talked about here about words. Ah. <sighs> Am I making sense, Nathan? Am I still making sense, or did the power bar? Do I need the power I, I, bar? I don't. I don't even know what you're saying. Oh, good, no. perfect. Then we're exactly where we need to be. To no, you're making sense. Like, okay, for sure. excellent. Of course. You're good. You're good. Uh, you're very coherent. Still, oh, you're good. still awake. You're still with us. Okay, good. You're still there. Okay, okay. excellent. <laughs> Rianne Williams, Psalm five ten. Declare them guilty, O Lord. Does this psalm mean there's a difference between praying for unbelievers and wicked people? I pray that people would be redeemed, not banished, but this psalm doesn't ask for redemption. I can pray this way about I can pray this way about evil in a person. I struggle to see how I could pray for a person's destruction though, because I know the only reason I'm not standing alongside them is because of God's mercy. How do you view this psalm? Mm -hmm. Brianne, that's a good question. Let's go ahead and look yes, at Brianne. Psalm five. Mm -hmm. That is exactly mm. it. That's that's he who is forgiven much loves much. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm. Wouldn't you rather tell somebody who's evil that you believe that they're going to no longer be evil, instead of speaking about like how they are messing up or how they're how they're like lost or misunderstanding? You speak something to him more along the lines of like, hey, I believe that God is doing the work in you. And I believe that there's going to come a day where you will understand. There will come a day where you do read the Bible for yourself. Like you, you actually are almost like prophesying over them. It's like a, it's a word of encouragement. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, it does sound like David is like deep in it. This is, this is a very human thing here. I, I love seeing these because, again, I think we can discern now, having read all the things that we have read, we can discern now mm -hmm. where this might be in David's walk. And I'll be exactly. the first to admit that wanting the destruction of my enemies or people that I perceive to be evil uh, or doing evil things, if I don't know them personally and don't happen to have compassion on them by just even laying my eyes on an individual person, or if they happen to be somebody who is in power, whom I strongly disagree with, I'll confess to wanting their destruction. Yeah, it's just smite them all, oh mighty smiter. Yeah, so you know this is this is uh, and again with men too. I mean, men uh, tend to want to do that to their enemies. No, they're, they're very gentle. Nah, they're very they they want. But they want to. They want to. Um. So, you know, again, I think I think this is the this is where y you have to take this is where you have to take the psalm in the context of the time of the writer. Exactly. Um, 
but to just pick this verse out and say God wants his enemies destroyed and if you find an unbeliever then you know make him destroyed that would be a total utter complete on its head wrong miss ever you know what I'm saying well if if you put the enemy on the human it's a miss but if you put the enemy on the sin it's not a miss God does hate sin. Yes. God even tells us later on, even out of Yeshua's own mouth, he says, never let the anger, never let your anger, never let the sun go down on your anger. Now, some people use that as in like, don't fall asleep at night angry. <laughs> That's not what it means at all. It, he's saying, don't allow your anger for sin and your anger for, for that which goes against God to ever be cooled, to ever stop being angry. Stay angry. It's and if you want to, so there's there's a difference between the sin and the sin. If you want to dig a slight bit deeper, let's look at Psalms five eight. Lead me, O Lord, or Jehovah, lead me, O Lord, in Thy righteousness, because of mine enemies. Make Thy way straight before my face, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is the very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulchre. They flatter with their tongue. Destroy thou them, O God. O God. Let them fall by their own counsels, cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they are rebelled against thee. Now, mine enemies, uh, sure, we could take it very literally, David, David's enemies, David's human enemies, but it doesn't actually necessarily say his human enemies. The word is Sharar. Right. The word is Sharar, it means enemy, but uh, Satan also means opponent. So Sharar and Satan is actually very close. Uh, uh, primitive root to be hostile okay uh, the o only active part participle and opponent enemy so Sharar and Shatan very close concepts and uh, sure he could be talking about people but uh, can't we see beyond that and and, and, uh, and and see that he's targeting sin well, here's the thing, though, too. Let's take a look at the humanity of David. I think that, that, that this is what I was saying earlier is that so in the beginning, this is what Psalm 5 we're talking about here. Psalm 6. What are we we're on 5, right? Uh, this is Psalm 5. Yeah, Psalm 5. So this is an early stage where he's being persecuted and out in the wilderness and people are trying to kill him for what? Just because it was prophesied over him that he's going to be king. So what has he done? Nothing wrong. He saved Israel. He killed Goliath and they want to kill him because there's some kind of prophecy over him. So it makes sense that he's actually talking about humans. It actually makes sense. So so again, if we take just this passage and, and we take it to the context of which David is saying at this time, but if we also take it as this is like a journal, this is David's experience, this is his journey. And if we say at this time, even the great king prophet David had moments where he just wanted to kill everybody who was opposing him. And we know because we've already read the books, that David actually counted soldiers, men, to kill Israel, Israelis, like Israelites, right? So so we know this. So so we know that David had a weak moment. We know that actually that's David's first big boo-boo that he makes. And so so this is what I'm saying. Like, let us not take it as every single word is what God is commanding us to do, but let us take it in its totality. Is God is explaining, listen, there's going to be seasons in your life where you're going to want to kill somebody. There's going to be seasons in life where you're going to want to be mad at the person who hurts you. Um, but there will be seasons in life where those people who were once your enemy, I will bring them back and you guys will be family. Or I will make, you know, everything good between you two and you guys will actually be allies even. Hmm. So, you know, it's, it, let us not take a look at every single sentence as literally like, a bullet law of God, but let us look at it as God is showing us the story of what it's like to be human and walk with him and grow in it. And here, that's my sense. Here's another interesting point, I think, that in Psalm 510 where he says, destroy them, O God. Well, the word destroy is actually a shame, oddly enough. Uh, it's, it's It would be pronounced a shame, which is an English word, and it, it, it means, you know, make them ashamed <laughs> but the actual word means by implication to be punished so yes destroy is one of the ways that this word can be um, translated 
But if you look at it, okay. it's only translated as destroy in this verse, Psalms 5.10. In actuality, it is translated most often 16 times in, in, in the Bible as guilty. So he is asking for righteous judgment. He say, make them ashamed, O God. Make them guilty, O God. And then it says, mm -hmm. let them fall by their own counsels, meaning sort of let them do what we've seen so often happen to, 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 to evil people in the Bible, where they, they come up with a trap and they fall into their own trap. And it says, cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions. Well, I mean, the laws of Moses literally said to cast out uh, those that break the law, uh, for they have rebelled against thee. So maybe the word destroy is a little bit not, a little bit overkill in the way that it is yeah. translated. So that maybe, Rianne, would cause you to go, well, I don't really want to pray for anyone's destruction. Yes, and that would be right. But yeah. here uh, he might just be praying for them to be found, f for them to receive the judgment that they that they deserve. Yeah, and we don't know. We don't know if the English scribe at the time translating this was having a bad day. You know what I mean? Like he he would read, and the nun slapped my hand, or or, or and and we should slap the hand of the sinner. Uh, you know, and then he turns it in. And he goes, "Ah, eh, we should just cut off the hand of the sinner." Like maybe he was just in one of those moods. We don't know, but that's why it's important to go to the go to the original context, the original text, as much as we can. Because maybe just somebody had a bad day. Mm-hmm. Sabrina Gylus 511. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. You have a promise for joy. Jehovah promises joy and gladness to us believers. Light is sown for us. The Lord will turn our night into day. And Evelyn Perkins comments, Sabrina, I love this. And, uh, and Sabrina says me too, and I I will agree with you, ladies. I love it as well. Damn. Uh, Sabrina five twelve. Um, you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with a shield. This is the greatest blessing of all: the favor of Yeho the favor Jehovah gives us, knowing that He looks on us with favor and pleasure. This is our standing in grace. A shield does not protect just one area of the body. It is a large it is it is large and mobile enough to cover every area of the body. It is armor over armor. This is how fully the favor of Jehovah, our standing in grace, protects us. I like that, Sabrina. I like that thought. Armor over armor. He says, put on the armor of God, and then he is our shield on top of that. I like that. <laughs> Uh, Psalm 6, Ricardo, um, Psalm 6, bitter and sadness because cause on pain, uh, asking forgiveness, showing respect before starting to speak, like knowing that in pain may make you say something you might regret later, asking for health only to keep praying him, living for thanking his glory, but also praying in faith, knowing our father listens to those who humble themselves, and he already knows that we're, what we're going to ask him. Um, first, uh, help me out here. The J N. What book is that? John. Is it John? Uh, I'm trying to think. If there's another thing, Jonah. Well, I guess I don't know. I don't know what J N is. I think it's John. John. I think J N is. Yeah. John. Yeah. Depends. Oh, yeah. That's the yeah. That's the at at the end there of the New Testament, First John oh. five fourteen through fifteen, and this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. He heareth us, and if we know that He hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. Yeah. I don't think that we understand how powerful that sentence is. So I'm really glad that you pointed that out. To actually have the ear of the creator of all things genuinely, authentically, like listening and, and hearing our petitions because Yeshua has bridged and opened up that communication, if you will. We don't understand the value of that. I mean, Yeshua gets mad at people throughout the New Testament because he's like, why don't you guys understand this? Like, what is it that you're not getting? 
Like, do you not understand? You could tell that tree to get up, go plant itself in the ocean. It will. You could tell that mountain to crumble and go flat and it will like who among us have that kind of faith. And even he said to Peter who kind of walked on water with him, Oh, ye of little faith. It's like, man, if Peter who walked on water with him has little faith, what does the rest of us have? You know what I mean? Like we just got to step up our game. We got to really like seek and grow in that faith. Like that's the thing. Let us let our faith grow, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, mm. Garrett, I do see your question. We do see your question, buddy. I think that's better uh, sent to Nathan uh, um, or or in private message. You know, later on, it's it's kind of not related to uh, what we're doing here at the moment, but we see it. Okay. Right. Um. Where, where we? Write, write me at Truth Me Free. That's the best place. Truth Me Free on Facebook is the best place to write me about that stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Sabrina, Sabrina Gaila, 6 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. There may be times when we believe we are chastened by Jehovah's hand when really we suffer trouble brought upon ourselves. Nevertheless, yeah. there are certainly times when the Lord does chasten his children. We know that Jehovah's chastening hand is not primarily a mark of his displeasure, but rather it is a mark of adoption. Hebrews 12.7 makes it clear that chastening is evidence of our adoption. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with his sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? When Jehovah corrects us, it doesn't feel pleasant, but it is good, and it is for our good. Living before the finished work of Yeshua, David had less certainty about his standing with Jehovah. On this side of the cross, we know that all the anger Jehovah has toward the believer was poured out on Yeshua at the cross. God chastens the believer out of correcting love and not out of anger. I'm so thankful to him that I'm living in this time after the cross. Yeah. Yeah. Um... It is, yeah. it is it is true sabrina that there's <laughs> there are some times when uh we, we we're, we're cha we think we're being chastened but we just sort of did it to ourselves yeah. um but um but, yeah you know but, but you know most most of the pain of the refining process is our fighting it you know it's like the more that we fight fight the process of the refinement the longer we stay in it but if we if we have the ability and the pause to take a look at our circumstances, perceive what it is that the Lord is refining us on and pointing out to us and growing us in, it immediately becomes a blessing. Not to say that it doesn't hurt, but it becomes a blessing. And at least having that perspective, it's I, I hate to word it like this. Maybe nobody else, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one, but it's almost like it, it puts a candy coat on it. You're like, yeah, circumstances stink right now. This is not fun right now, but man, I love it. I love it because I know that I'm growing and I've already perceived my growth and I already know that there's something that the Lord's doing. And now instead of sitting there going, oh my God, oh my God, how do I get out of this, this refinement, this horrible circumstance I'm in? Now you're like, wow, what, what is about to blossom from this refinement? Now you're looking forward to it ending, not because you want to be without the pain, but because you're so excited about the blessing that's coming at the end of it. You know what I mean? Our perspective keeps us in the pain longer. Sabrina Gaila 6 9. Um, I'm sorry, Sabrina Gaila 6 5. In death, there is no remembrance of you. The Old Testament has a shadowy understanding of the world beyond. Sometimes it shows a clear confidence, like Job 19 25, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And sometimes it has the uncertainty, like David shows here. 2 Timothy 1 10 says that Yeshua brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The understanding of the afterlife was murky at best in the Old Testament, but Yeshua let us know more about heaven and hell than anyone else could. Yeshua could do this because he had first-hand knowledge of the world beyond. Yeah. And he even said, how could I possibly tell you about the next world when I tell you things about this world you don't even understand? <laughs> Sabrina 6.9, the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. So weeping has a voice before Jehovah. It isn't that God is impressed by your emotional displays, but a passionate heart impresses him. David wasn't afraid to cry before the Lord, and Jehovah honored the voice of his weeping. We can see this in our own lives. When your children cry and are upset, 
You want them to feel better and help them in any way you can. How much more is this true of Jehovah? Because his love is so much bigger than we than than the love we can feel and grasp as humans. Yeah, man. Amen. True that. Mm -hmm. Um, can't even measure it. No. Thank God for that, isn't it? Isn't you know? Thank God for that. Truly. Psalm seven, Sabrina Gila seven four. If I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, the Hebrew word for evil here is ra. That made me think about Exodus, where the people of Egypt had all their gods. One of them was the god of the sun, called Ra. So, if you know what this word means in Hebrew, you can clearly see that this was evil they worshipped. Indeed, and I remember us talking about that uh, during uh, reading of the about the Exodus, and yeah, it's uh, yeah. To this day, you know uh, when. Um, you know, Jews refer to like the the heathens or the other side. They call it Mitzrayim, which means Egypt. So, to this day, the uh, ungodly are equivalent are, are are equated to the Egyptians. Exactly, those who go against them. Yeah, and if you read, and God. we'll read it later on that occasionally um, to make a point, um, uh, the nations of the believers or the cities of the believers are called Egypt in spirit, right? For a reason. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, Psalm 7, Psalm, uh, Sabrina Gaila 7, 9. Let the wicked of the wicked come to an end. I'm sorry. Let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. This reveals more of the heart of David's prayer. More than anything, he prayed for Jehovah to be just. David did not pray for special favoritism with Jehovah. He prayed for Jehovah to be just, and he searched his own heart to help put him right before the Lord. Yeah, um, you know, it's probably fair to say that only the righteous man would be excited about would be would be excited about God being just. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Um, and uh, so one day when you feel excited about God being just yourselves. <laughs> when you get there. When you get there. Uh, <laughs> that is a good day. That is a good yes, day. Yes, that is a good day. That is a very good day. Even when that justice falls upon yes. you, you still rejoice. When you rejoice in that, that is a good day. Okay. Sabrina Gilas 711. God judgeth the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. This is uh, commonly and dangerously rejected truth about Jehovah. Many anticipate that they will one day stand before a God of great love, great mercy, great warmth, and great generosity. They never imagine that they will stand before the one who is perfectly just and who cannot ignore the crime of sin. We can say that sin is a crime that it breaks the good and holy law of Jehovah, and sin can't be where he is. And while all sins are not equally sinful, some sins are worse than others and will receive a greater condemn condemnation, Matthew twenty three fourteen quote, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer, therefore you shall have, therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. There are no small sins. A sin stays a sin. I believe many people aren't aware of some sins they do. Like myself, I have learned so much these last two years about those things. Like, for example, your words have a great power in them. If you talk or speak negative, like gossiping about somebody or curse someone, that is a sin. Because in those cases, your words aren't in alignment with the words and truth of Jehovah. I think there are lots of sins we do unconsciously, not knowing it is a sin in the eyes of Jehovah. That's why I ask forgiveness every day for the sins I have made, the ones I'm aware of, but also the ones I'm not aware of. I ask Jehovah to show and teach me what is just and unjust in his eyes, so I can improve myself and not do those things again. Well, Sabrina, you describe a very good and healthy fear of the Lord, in my opinion. Yes, 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 yes. that was a great comment, absolutely. Yeah. It is good for us to be like, Lord, show me what I'm doing wrong. Show me what it is that, that I'm not seeing. It is a good thing for us to pray, to to see more and know more of the Lord's will in our life. 
and his righteous ways. And of course, reading scripture makes a huge difference as you were talking about Sabrina as well. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Man, it's almost like it's almost like the word is a cheat sheet. You know, like how else would we possibly you know we'd have to get reprimanded and then we're like, Oh, I got reprimanded, so I guess I'm not allowed to do that anymore. Like, but we could read the word and we can learn and we can bypass all that drama if we're able to you know, that is read so it. true you know how many people who believe but refuse to read they they know that god will teach them through circumstance through their life they will do something wrong they will get some sort of karmic feedback for it and they'll learn and they feel like that's the real learning and they call that living and learning right. and then and, 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 and they see a um they see a sort of a a singular relationship with god there and it, it is true it Bible is not meant to replace that, but it's meant to help you with that. <laughs> yeah, the Bible is the is the is the is the pointing of the direction and the path. The Holy Spirit is the thing that nudges you and keeps you on it. Yeah, I mean, I just yes, committing sin and then receiving the fruits of that and having those things be very unpleasant. Yes, that'll definitely teach you a lesson. Some people, not always. How many of us have repeated our sins multiple times? Well, that's, that's, that's true. And how many of us have repeated sins? Our life has crumbled because of it or God has refined us. And then we're sitting there at the end of it going, what did I do? I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't cheat. I didn't well, steal. I didn't kill. I didn't murder. That's kind of the point I'm getting to is, is oh, the, Bible, the Bible helps reveal those things so that you don't, right. you don't stay in the, you know, you, you, don't, you don't get stuck in that rut. But yes, Jennifer Conley asks a, a thing: Is a sin a sin? Teachers are held accountable at a higher standard for sin, so there is degrees to sin. There are degrees of sin. The passage that was actually just quoted, what you know, even talks about it. There are degrees of sin, but it's sin is sin in that division of God is division of God. But to how quickly, or in what manner, can you return and be right and and be you know good with God? That is holiness. And so sin is sin, but relationship is not the same. There are people who are held at a higher level of accountability. There are sins that are unforgivable, like blaspheming and denying the Holy Spirit are the two or one unforgivable sin. So sin is sin in the sense that all sins divide you from God and separate you from God. However, there is, depending on the sin, also demonstrates the heart of a person, right? So, you know. It, it, I hope you I hope you understand what I'm saying. It's like mm, this is a horrible analogy, but this is the only thing that's coming to my mind. A bullet is a bullet, <laughs> but whether you're shooting it at a target, an apple, a can, or a human, right? The bullet doesn't change. It's but the application and the results will change, right? So, so sure, somebody will sin, but maybe they didn't mean to, right? And then if somebody is a teacher, it, Yeshua explains in the New Testament why a teacher is held at a higher level of accountability. Not that a teacher's sin is a greater sin necessarily, but they're held at a higher level of accountability. If you teach, Yeshua said, you claim that you see. If you had said that you don't see, then you should be forgiven. But because you say you see, you cannot be forgiven. So that's the reason why a teacher is held at a higher level of accountability. If you're teaching this stuff, if you're putting yourself on the pedestal of, of one who teaches, that means that you're proclaiming to know the difference. And so, therefore, if you mess up, you messed up intentionally. So that's that's the difference. I hope that makes sense. It's kind of hard to describe. Yeah. Are you still with us, Alex? I am. Are you still there? I'm. I'm here. I. I. It made sense to me. It's. It's not comparing sizes. Of, well, never mind. Sizes of sin. Yeah, you're not comparing sizes of sin. You're comparing the. Uh, um, the attitude of. And the and the place of the sinner. Jerry Jensen asks, "So blasphemy cannot be repented and forgiven. To be to, to deny the Holy Spirit is to not allow the Holy Spirit into you and to save you, and so it's unforgivable because you're not allowing God to forgive you. Because in order for God to forgive you, you must embrace the cross. You must embrace the Holy Ghost. So it's the unforgivable sin is to hear the Word of God." to hear the story of Yeshua, to hear that the Holy Spirit saves, and then say, I don't need it. I don't need that to be saved. So you're literally 
God sends you a life raft in an analogy here. God sends you a life raft. Your boat has gone down. You're treading water in shark infested ocean and God sends you a boat and you go, I don't need that boat. I'm, I can, I can do this myself and you can't. And so it's unforgivable. How can God forgive you if you won't allow him to forgive you? So the, so there is talking when, when he talks about the, the blaspheming of the Holy spirit, which is another, it's kind of, there's kind of two. When you talk, when he specifically talks to blaspheming the Holy Spirit, this is the scenario that's going down. Yeshua performs a miracle and he casts out demons and he heals. And the and the and the rabbis at the time, the, the leaders of the, the temple, the priests at the time, say this man cast out demons with demons by the power of demons or the devil. And so what they did was they said that it wasn't the power of God that did this wonderful, beautiful thing and freed these people from these demonic possessions. So they took away the glory of God. They took away the acknowledgement and therefore the perpetuating promotion, if you will, of God's glory that he does forgive and that he does relieve of demonic possession. And so when you do that, there is an accountability, I guess, that cannot be forgiven. Uh, but I, I think you have to stay in that and this is nathan this this part i'm saying here is this is my own personal two cents i believe you have to stay in that belief system that and you have to you have to stay in that 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 statement of your life saying the holy ghost isn't what does the miracle the holy ghost isn't what heals people uh it was a fluke it was science it was this and that if you stay in that place that's denying the work of the holy spirit and that is unforgivable you should say but if you if you realize the flaw of your way and you are no longer in that, then you are a new creation. The dead you has fallen away, just as Yeshua also said. And then you realize the Holy Spirit and you and you would say, no, that was the Holy Spirit that did that. I do need the Holy Spirit to be saved. And so I, I think it's more of a life thing than it's a one time moment thing, um, because I think all of us would be doomed uh, as if we were non-believers. Because how? Because any time as a non-believer, if we were like, yeah, I get you believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and all that, I don't. Right there, you just denied the Holy Spirit, right? Or if so, if, if you've ever been witnessed to, and somebody says you need Jesus to be saved, and you go, I don't need Jesus to be saved. I don't need God to be saved. You just denied the Holy Spirit. So if we were, if if it was just a one-time sentence, uh, then then we would all be doomed. But I think if we live in that to our death, and when we live to our end, saying I don't need God, then you don't need God, and when you die, you won't be there. So that's that's Nathan adding two cents because there's it's a it's a hard thing to understand. So I I agree with that. If if uh, if denying the Holy Spirit was a, a one time transgression that you could not turn away from, mm -hmm. uh, we we all wouldn't be here right now. We'd all be too. We'd yeah. already have been judged. So. Um, it's 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 denying it while you have all the opportunities you're given not to deny it exactly it's continuation of denying it like because you just don't want to be accountable or you just don't want something else to save you and really that's pride you know really the the sin that really will destroy you is pride and that's what it was with these rabbis they didn't want to believe that this seemingly poor homeless has only one set of clothing prophet man was actually able to do what they themselves being prayer warriors every day wearing holy clothes and being chosen in the levitical line or whatever uh levite line whatever you know they didn't want to believe that he could do what they could not that he was closer to god than they were i mean so so it was their pride that made them say he does this out of devils not from the holy spirit and and that's man that's 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 the, that's the unforgivable thing. They're they're not willing uh, to allow one who appears less than them to be greater than them. Hmm. Rough times. Sabrina Gaila seven twelve. If he not turn, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. With Jehovah so ready to judge, the sinner should never presume that Jehovah will delay his judgment. The only thing that holds back the immediate judgment of Jehovah against the sinner is his love and mercy towards us, giving us an unknown period of time to repent. Such mercy should never be presumed upon. I think it, I think that's very applicable today. So many people think they still have time to confess their sins, that they could stay in their sin just one more day. But what if this day is your last one? 
That's why I believe it's so important to repent every day and do your ultimate best to turn away from your sins. Yeah. Ricardo, uh, Psalm 7, 14 through 17, Behold, he travaileth with iniquity. He hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit and digged it and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealings shall come down upon his own pate. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness, and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. This reminded me about the uh, book of Esther, about Haman and the gallows of fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai to be hung, and which later Haman were hung. That's right. Yeah. Nail on the head there. Yep. Sabrina Gaila 716. His mischief shall return upon his own head and his violent dealings shall come down his own head. Two examples of this among many in the Bible are the book of Esther. Yep. Um, and Harbonah, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold the gallows fifty cubits. Yep, that's for Haman. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep perusing through because we, we I think we all remember this one. See also in the book of Daniel, in the lion's den, Daniel six twenty four, and the king commanded that they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces, and ever, or ever they came at the bottom of the den. Hmm. Yeah, we haven't gotten to that part yet, folks, but we shall. Okay. Sabrina 717, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness, and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. David ended his psalm, which began in gloom, on a high note of praise. He could praise because he took his cause to Jehovah and in faith left it there. Very good. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Psalm 8. Sabrina. Okay, let's, let's stop. Let's go ahead and stop because it's been two and a half hours. Yeah. And you guys, we, we don't want to rush this. We don't want to rush this. I know I know that there's going to be people watching this pre-recorded. So let's go ahead and end this video here at the beginning of 8. We'll pick up next week with 8. Or is next week, Alex, the week you're going to have to miss? Yeah. It is. It is, right? Okay. So. so why don't we do this, guys? Let's let's do this. Let's uh, let's uh, we'll, we'll save the notes for this one. We'll post the graphic again. Uh, ne not this coming week. Alex won't be able to do it. But the week after, uh, we'll do it again. Uh, we'll, we'll pick back up and we'll do eight through 20 and, uh, and that'll give us 12 chapters. And, uh, but it's really important. We don't rush guys. I know we all want to get through the Bible, but, um, but let's, 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 let us take this time. Also, um, if you guys could just to help out Alex, uh, just give the, the quote of the passage. Don't actually type. Well, I mean, Alex has, Alex will have the Bible. So just give the, the quote, the number of the passages that you're referring to. So that way, if we need to, we can do it. Because otherwise, Alex is kind of like Ron Burgundy. If it's up on the prompter, he's going to read every single thing. The poor guy's throat and all this is going to go go shot by the time that this whole thing's done. He's going to sound like a like a cancer survivor. Ron Burgundy? Oh, cancer survivor yeah, oh, yeah like Ron that. Burgundy, if you guys haven't yeah. seen it yet, he just, whatever's on the prompter, he'll read. So... Do Alex a favor, you guys. Don't write out the scripture unless you're you're quoting it for a particular point. But uh, just give the number of the scripture, and then um, and in the and 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 let's try to help Alex just by shrinking as much as we can to get to our point. And I know I myself am like one of the most long-winded people. I'm not saying show. I'm not saying hold back and cut out pieces of what you're saying. I'm just saying for the for the sake of Alex's throat. Let's uh, when we write out our comments, let's try to uh, to think of the most concise way to uh, to get to get to where we're going. So that way, poor Alex uh, can can continue to read everybody's comments. You guys get what I'm saying, right? Understand? I'm not saying don't write, <laughs> and I'm not saying don't have a full thought. Just let's try to word it in a more uh, precise and uh, a point so that Alex uh, can can say it better. You guys understand, right? All right. Um, anything else, Alex? You got it. Anything? Uh, no, um, I think that, uh, you know, I, as we've said, you know, it's not surprising that there's lots of thoughts on Psalms. So yeah, not, we definitely don't want to, the last thing we want to do is there be any editing of actual thinking or sharing. Um, so it's all good. Yeah. But uh, just That's the point of this, this is it, awesome. The point of this is fellowship. Yeah. So this is awesome. Point of this is totally fellowship. And uh, is, you know, it's just next week. When, when Alex is gone, you guys, will do a live Q&A. So uh, I'll do a live Q&A with you so that we still have fellowship and we still get together. So so we'll plan that. Uh, and then when Alex comes back, um, 
for the for the following week, then we'll we'll pick up where we left off, which will be eight. Cool. I love the Ron Burgundy meme there. Yeah. Can you imagine that guy? What's Can you meme imagine meme? that guy reading your comments? No, that would be funny. Yeah. Okay. That would be hilarious. All right, you guys. Um, I am uh, I am spent, okay, but I, I love you. Yes, Yeshua Network, amazing T-shirts. Uh, thank you to the lovely lady who made them and sent them to us. And um, mm. you know we're very proud of them. We love them, and um, we love you, and we absolutely love the Bible, and we absolutely love Yeshua Hamashiach. So. Yes. Um, we look forward, I look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks now. And, uh, you know, thank you guys for yeah. your amazing, amazing dedication and comments and your love for the Lord and his word. And maybe you'll have your new computer, not this coming week, but maybe you'll have some Ooh, of it set up already. Huh? That would be pretty amazing. Yeah. 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 You guys, maybe Alex won't have us. Maybe Mr. Square won't even be with us on the next one. Maybe this was Ooh. Mr. Square's last last visitation let's, with let's us. hope Thanks that that is the that. case i would love to retire mr square Ooh, i'm gonna miss him a little bit because i think it's funny but yeah you guys, <laughs> be blessed be the blessing you guys we are yeshua network and uh thank you so much for those of you who participate and make this happen it means the world to me and alex and i know i know that it that it is making a difference in the world we live in and that the lord bless us all hallelujah, hallelujah. amen guys have a great week